what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like live here at Black Power Media. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Happy to be your host at I Mix What I Like for all your relevant social media. For more about me and other work uh, and some pretty incredibly dope catalogs of interviews, essays, and other things by uh, by and with me uh, and many others, go to imixwhatilike.org. We have a really I mean, I was just reminded of it the other day. In fact, last night, in fact, related to something we're going to talk about a little bit today, I was reminded of that 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 archive, and it's pretty damn extensive. Uh, so please make use of it. Um, same thing, make sure, please, that you're all signed up at blackpowermedia.org and uh, following everything there. Um, and signed up please do uh subscribe like share join uh author balagoon as a new member and make uh your avail yourselves of some of the special members only stuff i'm gonna see if i can give my connection here a chance to catch up that by the way it's funny i see myself lagging here a little bit again uh only when we start I've been setting up for a good hour or so. There's been no issue. And I was in touch with StreamYard, by the way, um, and went over with them in detail my setup. And I can and will happily confirm here that the issue is theirs. This is not an issue with my setup. Um, uh, who knows what else may be going on, but but that, that much because... Um, I even went and added more to the to the setup for the Wi-Fi and stuff. So uh, we'll see if it catches up here in a second. I am expecting uh, Kaba Akintunde to join us, and in the second hour, we're going to be joined very in a very special way by Minister Server of the Renegade, Renegade Culture Crew. Uh, so, um, but by the way, the the, the you know so so I, I do want to hope that the the that folks come on in. And uh, get their coffee as we hold it down for the Remix Morning Show crew. Invite a friend, foe, comrade, colleague to join us. Um, and hopefully the connection will catch up here because the connection coming to the laptop is perfectly strong. The connection coming into the additional, by the way, brand new mesh router that is less than four feet away is perfectly functional. There we go. Maybe that'll kick in. But what it is, is with StreamYard, and this is something, that, again, we're going to have to continue to look into. Uh, and they told me they're trying to develop an app, which is supposed to help because the issue is uh, with the Chrome browser. Uh, I was told that the way StreamYard com communicates with the Chrome browser, uh, they would prefer that we use. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good morning, Dawn. Yeah. Bring a foe. Bring a foe. <laughs> bring a foe why not um uh and buenos dias debra debra buenos dias and I, i'm glad you barely see the lag and i appreciate you sugar booger there really is a lot of good stuff stuff that i mix what i like uh dot org and, and bless up to you uh Roz l bo uh and uh um uh, peace, peace, Obioma. Peace, peace. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I know, Roz, you told me to get the wire, but listen, what I'm saying is that's what I'm saying. I confirmed that it's not an issue of the Ethernet thing. It's an issue of the way StreamYard con communicates with Chrome. And they even acknowledged, first of all, they said you should use Firefox, which I did try to do, but Firefox doesn't allow you to share audio. 
So that's why we're supposed to be using Chrome. Uh, but they're they're saying that they they're trying to develop an app so that um, they are the, the 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 I guess the added step of having to communicate through the browser. At least is how it was explained to me. Um, but I mean, I shouldn't need an Ethernet cord if I'm sitting here. Again, there's so much power coming to this computer. And the da the daggone mesh thing is right there. <laughs> it shouldn't even require all that. Uh, and yeah. Um, and plus, I do have to get to work because Shirley, yeah, absolutely. You are absolutely right. I got to get to work. Uh, on 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 my response to Kalanji, that joint was hilarious. I hope you've all seen it by now. Um, the 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 Kalanji the the assault on uh me and Kamal uh laid out by Kalanji. Um, by the way, uh, uh, in, in just a few minutes when, when Kaba gets here, we are going to get into a couple of things of, of, of more or less some substance here. Uh, by the way, it's not, it's, it's, it's not all just complaining about lags and, and, and Kalanji, but, but, um, and I hope this even shows up because I just want to make sure you all saw this joint, this joint. I think it is the funniest thing I've ever seen. But he's going to get it. He is definitely going to get it. And what's messed up about mine is that, as I've said, you know, from about I, somewhere around six in that six to eighth grade range, uh, I did wear my hair like that. And I was called I'll be sure. And I know at one point I consciously was going for the I'll be sure look. So that was what was funny to me. I do agree with others, though, that the the picture he did with Kamal looks is, is so daggone almost perfect that that you could almost think this is Kamal taking this shot right here uh uh you know mine isn't quite as perfect but it's still funny and I and I just and again because of the the, the actual overlap with my lived experience uh when I did try to rock the high top fade, I did not try I mean I was rocking the high top fade I had the you know gotta get off when you're old girl gotta get off when you're old <laughs> I was trying, man. I was trying. And, uh, you know, anyway, so this, I, I really do think this is the funniest thing I've ever seen, but Kalanji going to get it one way or another. Kalanji going to get it. Um, uh, what's up? Good morning, my man. Kaba. Uh, I, I think you, you, you made it in. Okay. It's good to see you. I appreciate you joining us this morning. How are you, sir? Good morning. I'm well, good morning. How are you? Can you hear me? Yeah. I hear you loud and clear. Uh, All right, and wonderful. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, so I was just, you know, uh, going over with the, with the good folks as, as we, we uh, let, let the lag get caught up and folks come on in uh, that, that Kalanji is about to get it. Uh, yeah, you know, man. Well, you, you, you he better get it because you sure enough got it. You and Kamal sure enough got it yeah, uh, yeah. from him. So, yeah. uh, it, so I mean, th th that, that, that requires an adequate response, my brother. So you all got a lot of work to do. Absolutely. So... So look, man, I, you know, uh, uh, always good to see you. Glad you could join us uh, uh, this morning um, before Minister Server gets here next hour. Because speaking of Kalanji also in Renegade Culture, like like I when I was on with them a couple weeks ago in the off air segment, uh, uh, Minister Server started talking a little bit about his background, his career and his experience with KRS and the Temple of Hip Hop and stuff like that. And I was like, wow, I never even heard his whole story. And I was like, when are you going to do an interview with Server? Like, when are we going to hear a server story? And Kamau and Kalanji were like, well, when you have him on, I mix what I like. And I was like, well, then, damn, I will then. If you're not going to, you know, give the man his space on his own show, uh, we'll just bring him on over here and let him rock here. Because I think there's, you know, he's always in the background on Renegade Culture where you'll see, folks will see him later on tonight. But he's got a really fascinating history uh, in hip hop and activism. Uh, and and uh, so we're going to talk with him about that in in the next hour. Um, but, uh, in this hour, we're going to talk at least a little bit about, uh, this latest, uh, dust up around Afro pessimism. And I do, if we can want to return briefly to something that I think got lost in yesterday's remix, uh, that I was trying to point out about what Matt Taibbi was saying about the state of journalism. Uh, but then you also sent something that I thought that, that, uh, um, uh, is worthy of looking at as well. 
uh, in terms of uh, the latest uh, odd solidarity among the squad, you know, who keep telling us they can't vote as a unit, all of, you know, have now all of a sudden voted as a unit, uh, but you know, uh, uh, against what many of us would 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 have wanted them to 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 do, and and what many who voted for them to be in office to comprise this squad were hoping that they would do with their votes. They're not really doing that either. Uh, so so we'll, we'll probably get to that. Uh, um, uh, I think we should get to that even before the, the revisiting the Taibbi piece, just to make sure we have time for that. So, uh, but anyway, did you? Was there anything else I missed that 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 I'm forgetting? Um, no, no, that, that's it. As a matter of fact, I think that in some ways there's a linkage between um, the Afro pessimism piece and the squad, um, okay. and ah, this, this issue with the squad. I, uh, um, in terms of of allyship and 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 the shortcomings of allyship, uh, because he pointed out uh, in the in the article, he meaning uh, Wilderson pointed out in the article that one of the things that uh, happened during this whole George Floyd uh, situation is that we went from defund the police all the way now to basically just trying to reform the system. Um, and basically that's kind of like what the squad did because the squad initially came out saying defund the police and sounding quite militant. Now this is not, he, he's talking about race. Interesting. And Interesting. But, but no. I think in this particular, in this particular space, they're talking, they were talking about defunding the police and so forth. And now They've now come to the point now where basically some of them, some of them like Corey Bush and uh, Bowman and 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 uh, and um, Presley and some some of them did vote against this new bill for the that would increase uh, funding to the police. But the others who could have voted against it, it to stop it from happening, uh, like the Ocasio Cortez uh, you know, voted just voted present, which basically allowed this bill to pass by. Uh, by one vote, you know, so if if all of them would have voted no against this particular bill, um, then they would have uh, it wouldn't have passed. But they voted for a two billion dollar bill uh, to basically uh, give more money to the Capitol Police. Now, just real quick, because I, I, I'm just seeing this in this story. First of all, uh, and I know I keep getting roasted for it, but but again, I do watch the Jimmy Dore show the way many watch CNN I do or MSNBC. Yeah, I know you do, but I, I'm just saying I keep getting roasted for it. And, and I, don't know why. Uh, I don't know why either, but but uh, uh, because, again, I'm not looking to him for analysis. I'm looking to him right. because I don't want to watch CNN and MSNBC. It's good. Why don't white crime? And it is, uh, thank you. And it is, and it is hilarious. And I bring it up now because when he goes at the intercept and specifically this author here, Ryan Grimm, it is some of the funniest roasting, uh, uh, dragging of, of, of mainstream journalism you can get. So, so maybe we'll see something in, in an upcoming episode uh, of his show about, about this one, but essentially you're right. And, 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 and the summary is, is, uh, that you offered is, is perfect. That, that the, the only thing I wanted to add is that, that watching Jimmy Dore, I also was reminded that AOC has previously uh, um, uh, dragged others for using the present vote when they should have voted Absolutely. yes or no. In fact, he showed a tweet where she said, you have to vote yes or no. Voting present is some sort yep. of like, uh, um, you know, a, a treachery or some You're complicit. Word, but you're, you're complicit. complicit. You're com so here she yeah. is voting present, allowing for uh, this 1.9 billion in funding uh, to go uh, uh, to the Capitol Police, when in fact, as you said, everybody's been, I thought people had voted for her and were telling me that she and others represented the hope in the Democratic Party and the, the two party electoral system as we have that could be pushed. And she was, you know, anyway, so, and 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 I'm glad you made that point. That is, you know, the the, the parallel you're drawing here is perfect because uh, as we're going to show in a second, this is something that that Wilderson does bring up to help support his own argument. Uh, uh, and and I didn't even think to to draw the connection. So that's again, that's why I like to work with with others because you know, anyway. So anyway, thanks for that. But but just in a, a quick setup. Yesterday I was in an email group. I was emailed as part of a group of um mostly uh, well uh i believe all everyone was black mostly the materialist marxist socialist wing uh with some folks that many in our audience would know uh very prominent names i don't think it's appropriate for me to say more than that right now um 
uh, but some very prominent. And someone sent me this article from Frank Wilders, and they said, and the whole the point to the group was it wasn't sent to me. I was just in this group. The point of the email was, uh, and frankly, he said he said Frank is bullshit. That was he was like this is this is more of that bullshit from Wilderson and Afro pessimists, and this is the one that exposes the the, the fraudulence in Afro pessimism past pessimists in Frank's argument. My response was to the group, more or less, um, uh, and while I did not use any foul language, uh, at least one person suggested, which I often do here, honestly, that I went a little too hard in the email. But the the I don't agree with that, but I hear that all the time, so I think it's fair to say that share at least that that's one one you know response. But my point was, you all in this group have to stop doing this. That 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 uh, dismissing the argument with calling it BS and, you know, uh, uh, dismissing it as silly, all this, like, I think you all need to come up with a better argument because I said, the more I've been reading late, lately, some of the critiques, the more I'm seeing the flaws and the criticisms than the, uh, not that I don't see any in Frank or, or Afro pessimism. Uh, and we'll talk some about that in a minute, but I'm just, I'm just, I was just frustrated, uh, with, with this general response and we're just all in this email group supposed to accept it without, without question. So I was just saying, so, so yeah. make the argument. So, so part of the response from this person was, uh, well, Frank, and we'll get to this in a second. Frank says capitalism and colonialism are not the origins that, that anti-blackness is not uh, the, the, res the, the result of these, it has its own situation. And he was like that. That alone that should tell you capitalism that. didn't create racism. That, That's uh, right. Some, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. And I just so and my point was, you all need to stop blasting Afro pessimism and not uh, making a real argument and stop denying that your real problem. This is actually that was my point. Your real problem is that this is really a rebranded, fancy languaged version of a race first argument. So, and I know you all don't like that, but say that instead of just saying it's BS, because I don't think that's helpful. And I don't even think some of your criticisms are right. Uh, yeah. um, his response, this person's response was that I was being silly. Uh, 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 another person responded by saying, African, why the emotionalism? Which I didn't respond well to that. And I let him know this morning that I don't appreciate that. And I hope we can talk about that because I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't appreciate that. Um, and yeah. I think, and I think, I think, forgive me if I say this, where I think men know that when men say that to another man, that this, they're really saying something else about them. So, so I was, I don't appreciate that. I was, but my point was, that's still not an argument and you didn't make an argument. And I, so I sent him an email just before we went on saying, look, I, I, I was like, I think anyway, we should talk. Cause that was whack. I was like, that was a mess yeah. of a response. I don't appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's the origins, at least for me. That's why I was like, let me. So I went and read the article uh, and I started reading, uh, uh, finally started reading Frank's Afro pessimism book. Um, and I will say, because uh, 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 I actually am excited about this and I appreciate that, I, that she's willing to do this. Dr. CBS is is going to debate me on this over the summer, um, which which. Could be a little intimidating. I'm not gonna front, uh, mm -hmm. but but we, we you know I don't we don't agree, and I don't think I I'll at least say I don't understand what where where at least some of the arguments are coming from. So we're gonna debate. And we'll see what happens. Yeah. You know, so we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so let me pull up the article and then go ahead. If you I've, I've said enough, go ahead and and, and you can um, share any of your initial thoughts, and then we can go from there. Doctor Jared Ball, you just you just you just. You just have to pull me into this discussion. You just have to make me. You, you've been trying to get me to do this forever, man. I said, this dude here, man. <laughs> you just try. You, now, see, because my, my whole position before was like, what are our common, what are the commonalities in our struggle? And I'm about focusing on those because I think sometimes we get, we, we've almost become ideologues in the mm -hmm. sense that we get so hung up on on these particular arguments, particularly this particular argument. And I know people say, well, this is fundamental and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, as as I read the article, I pretty much agree with everything that he that he said. But you know that you know mm -hmm. where I stand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Uh, right, right, right. I do. I do not believe that that racism came from capitalism uh, and there's historical antecedents uh, to, to to capitalism. Uh, 
you Take know, one or two of those. If you were, where are you coming from? With the, I'm sorry, I think I think you were about to, and I just cut you off. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, yeah, I, I think that the Greeks and the Romans and 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 many other European uh, uh, tribes that existed long before there was a capitalist uh, idea project over the past five to six hundred years um, have have been racist um, long before. So I mean, just just that in and of itself, I think that this book right here uh, <laughs> outlines quite a bit. Google, Google uh, mm-hmm. and 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 I haven't heard anybody yet really uh, uh, go against what she was saying. Even even Sheikh Anta Joe, who was married to a white woman, uh, mm-hmm. who himself was identified more with Marxist leanings, mm-hmm. uh, pretty much in his arguments uh, when he talked about in civilization or barbarism, uh, that there was a that that there seemed to be uh, a a not only racist but just anti nature. Uh, uh ethos that emanated from Europeans and he he proffered an idea uh that it came from their environmental uh there was there was an environmental factor the ice age and the, yeah the whole the argument two cradle the theory right the, the, two, the, two the two cradle, the two cradle theory, theory. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah and he goes a little bit more into the into the cultural piece and the cultural unity of mm-hmm. black Africa where he talks about the two cradle theory as a, a little bit more in that particular book um and he gave us quite a few um lessons in terms of that so so i so for me uh it's it's pretty clear um and and one of the arguments that that wilderson made um because he says the state kills and contains black bodies the left kills and contains black desire erases black cognitive maps that explain the singularity of black suffering and most of all fatally constricts the horizon of black liberation you know and that has been the case you know just across the board the, the ideas of blackness, the ideas that are that that come from us are not accepted generally by the white left. The only time they tend to accept us is if we if as if we regurgitate their ideas. As and so there there are a litany of certain factors that that you have to kind of be down with as a black person to be down with white folks on the left. When you start getting into this black stuff, then you start getting in trouble. And even black Marxists have had to suffer that particular consequence when they try to kind of move on their own and kind of have their own independent thought, uh, whether we're talking about Richard Wright, whether, we, whether we're talking about um, the Black Socrates, you know, that's mm-hmm. been getting a lot of play on this mm-hmm. particular uh, program as well, uh, and, and many, many others, uh, you know, uh, even Du Bois, up to Du Bois, you know, so so there, there seems to be, when it comes to an independence of thought, a Black thought, and I think that's one of the pieces that Wilderson What's really pointing out is that the the white left constricts us, and very much way the same way that Malcolm talked about uh, the white left, um, and talking about the the liberals being more of a wolf, uh, you know, seeming like friends. But I think the idea that Malcolm was really getting at was the fact that um, independent black thought is constricted in the white left. And for me, it, I've always found it peculiar that so many of us get so caught up on around white people. Like we, 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 we start arguing with other black people about white people. I mean, sure. You can have some white allies. That's fine. You know, I don't, you know, and I, for, as far as I'm concerned, like black, black national race, first black folks, we, we are down with, we like the, we love the Panthers. You know, uh, when I came into this, I didn't, I wasn't aware of the, the, the class and the race argument when I first came into this 30 years ago in the military, as we discussed a few weeks ago, Mm-hmm. You know, but but immediately when I was getting into the culture, I was also getting into the to the, the black Marxists and all of that. I was getting into Walter Rodney. As a matter of fact, Dr. Khaled Muhammad, who was a who was all always accused of being, you know, kind of like one of these people. Um, you know, he always talked about Reed Rodney and and read all of these, you know, the, uh, uh, Maurice Bishop and all and, and all of these black uh, people that are on the you know, that were on the Marxist spectrum. We, we've always for the most part, we've always, uh, you know, pretty much taken in the work. That these people had to uh, had to offer. We've never had a problem, but it seems like a lot of folk uh, have a problem with with uh, with us, and and will totally cut off everything else simply because uh, we we position ourselves uh, culturally. And then it, it, there's these old sixty year old arguments that young people who weren't even around back then are still having that that folk had back then, and they're saying the same kind of things against. Um, culture that folks said 60 years ago as if everybody who's into culture is somehow, you know, pork chop or they just talking or they armchair or the whole tip. 
when 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 there are several examples to the contrary and you and you yes you can you can have your omar your, your umar johnsons and you know you got clowns out there there's no question about it but many of them are not really taken seriously by folks who are really serious and are, and are really about the work you know mm -hmm. so so for so so that's why for me i just always i always try to focus on what we have in common uh, because I'm trying to get free. I'm not trying to argue with no black people over white people and and, and whatnot. Uh, I, I like I said, I agree with a lot of the positions. I, I listen. I'm, I'm here part of this. I've followed your work for a long time. I know where you stand ideologically. I don't allow that to say all oh, that balls into that the Marxist stuff. I ain't, you know, I'm not going <laughs> to listen to them at all. You know, that's not the case for me. You know that you yeah, know me. Right. You know me for a long mm -hmm. time. Uh, well, I mean, so that's, that's why not we, the case yeah. for me or for yeah. many people. You know, so yeah, I just wanted to just just so to your. Answer. And I also feel like I'm, I you know, I you know, I always struggle with with whatever ism I identify with because I I uh, um, there are, are elements of all of these isms that I deeply appreciate. So uh, mm -hmm. um, I just want more of the discussion among, as you say, among us on the left. So so I want to start there actually because and I and I sent this to him. I, I told Frank this, uh, and I don't want to suggest we're we're tight. I haven't heard from him in a minute. He I've been asking him. Uh, a couple times lately to come on uh and i even joked with him uh in this last email to which i've not had a response that that you know like um you know, basically and, and after i saw that he published this in the nation i said i, I joked with him but kind of seriously like i feel like you owe me a visit now like because because one of the criticisms that 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 of of frank's work and this one this piece in particular i do uh feel in a sense that uh, uh, to you know, so part of, to your point, Kabat, like one of the is, one of the criticisms Frank get Frank gets is that his audience is white, that he's not really writing to black people, that he's not his, he's not, Afro, and he's not, um, he's not, and I. And and that's and I agree. And I and when I saw this in the nation, that pissed me off more almost than any like <laughs> like before we even get Bro, to when you when you sent me this, I was that's the the very first thing I thought. And then I was reading it and I said, okay, all this academies, you could have just said that really much simpler, you know, you, talking about pincers and all this other one, stuff. All don't that nobody, that stuff. Don't nobody I, understand all that stuff. Yeah, don't I get nobody it. understand any of that stuff. And in fact, <laughs> a, a good friend of a, a good friend, and I'll tell you off air because I think he's a good friend of yours also. But this isn't for I can't he I wouldn't be giving permission. This I got you. He sent me he sent me uh, uh an introductory paragraph from something fred moton had written recently about what blackness is and because i was asking because i said i haven't read much i haven't read as much from of moton and i don't always understand what i'm reading when i do and he and he said he said brother that's by design brother and he said watch this he sent me this this paragraph just he said read this and he read it we read it together and i and he was like he, and it was supposed to be defining blackness and he was like brother now what black person in this country would read this and understand what the hell he's talking about and i'm like I don't know, man. I thought you were going to break it down to me was my point. So I agree with all of that. So I'm on the one hand, I'm willing to say, look, I, I wouldn't mind getting my vocabulary up. I could maybe read a little bit. My 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 mind grapes could be expanded a little bit. I'm not mad, mad at that. But on the other hand, I'm with you. And I'm like, come on, man. Are you who are you talking to with all of this? Who? Um, and then there's in the a nation, I was style, like, there's a, but there's a certain style of writing yeah. um, that 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 black folks know will appeal to white people and actually in a sense in a kind of crazy way ironic way he's actually making his own point in, ter in terms Interesting. of in terms of in terms of being uh being accessible making oneself accessible you know to right. white folk and, and whiteness so that's kind of ironic that, that that that's the case that's what i'm saying i'm like you know yeah. so so then i'm like and then you go public and then i'm so i'm saying to frank man like obviously he doesn't really owe me anything but i'm like man come on man you're gonna publish this in the nation you gotta come on and talk right. to me man you know like you, mm -hmm. you 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 owe me that but this was so so this was the line that that was quoted initially uh as proof that frank doesn't know what he's talking about and you've somewhat already addressed this anti-black racism is not a byproduct of capitalism or patriarchy or even colonialism nor is anti-black racism in any way analogous to any other paradigm of oppression anti-blackness is its own beast conceptual framework that cannot be analog analogized to capitalism or any other ism I struggle with this all the time. And to your point, look, I know that there are instances of racism that predate capital, but I, uh, um, uh, you know, I also agree with, with the histories that talk about the impact certainly of capital on those racisms. And, and, and even as Dr. Clark pointed out, you know, the racism was different back then, you know, there was African popes and African emperors of Rome and Africa, you know, all of this stuff. So the racism, you know, may, may not have been the same or would have obviously gone through some adjustments, uh, uh, with capital. You had, you had, you had, you had, you had exceptionalists, 
uh, just mm-hmm. like you have now. It's like mm-hmm. right now, people can say, well, we had Obama, but we got mm-hmm. Kamala Harris. So that's so that's different. No, it's not different. The, 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 the Roman Empire, even though you had seven Roman emperors, still persisted to, to that's right. The, that's right. The, the benefit of Rome. Just In like fact, the American I remember, Empire still persists to the benefit yeah. of America, even though you have an Obama or Kamala Harris or whomever. That's right. And I, I remember uh, the, the poet Heyru, we used to play it on the radio all the time, his, his yes. September, September Severus poem for his Obama. Barack Obama. September yeah. Severus. And, and, and folks got mad, boy, because this was oh. still in 0607, you know, so 08. People were mad, boy. Anyway, but he was right. Um, yeah. um, my The way I've tried to deal with this in 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 to 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 your point to try to avoid i was thinking i could to try to avoid some of these intra black arguments was to say and and this is what i even said in this in this email exchange i started the show off by describing i said i because i was trying to say if you aren't being disrespectful and dismissive of me one question i would want to raise in response to this would be um isn't it possible that yes racism as we know it today is born of capital and capitalism, colonialism and enslavement. Uh, but at this point, to Frank's point, have its own life disconnected from that history, where even addressing those histories would not necessarily overturn what is now I, I described as an out of the box anti-black racism. So so I, in other words, I'm trying to say, like, let's avoid the chicken or the egg argument. Um, I have no problem capitalism creating a new form of white supremacy, a hyper, whatever you want to call it, a, 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 a whatever. Um, but I also feel at this point, <laughs> what level of revolution would it take to get that out of place? And I don't, I'm not convinced that even a, a redistribution of social, socialist materialist revolution would do that. Maybe over time, you know, it would, but, and I would certainly want to see that as a stage. Let's at least get there. But, uh, but I don't know. So anyway, I was just trying to raise that, but, but, but. Well, but, the, the Soviet it, Union it had work. 60, the Soviet Union, even among what, to your point, the Soviet Union, even among white folks, had 60 years. And I know that there was some incursions of capital from well, the West and all of that. I, I know that there was some, I know that there was some of that, but mm-hmm. they're still fighting over, 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 over ethnicity. You know, I, I, mm-hmm. I, at the end of the day, all that balkanization, all of that stuff, they're fighting over ethnicity. They're, that's mm-hmm. what they're fighting over, over hierarchy, even, even within themselves. And they, that mm-hmm. happened even all of, over the, all over the world with, with, with white folks, because that's the kind of structures that they have had. Um, in terms of the capitalist piece for me, I, sure, I, I agree that capitalism uh, had a role in maybe exacerbating racism and so forth, uh, and all of that. Sure, no question about it. I just don't believe that it's uh, that it's uh, it's the origin of racism, and that there obviously like there was no like racism just sprang out of out of this. And I, I don't think that's the case at all. Um, you know, and you know, j- just as uh, taxonomy was born out of a need. Uh, to establish a hierarchy taxonomy, just basically the ranking of races. And the guy Linnaeus had a birthday to, uh, a couple of days uh, years ago. <laughs> Did he? I know that's that's one of your boys. His birthday was Good a couple Carl. days ago. <laughs> Carl Linnaeus, you know, the, the 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 father of taxonomy. You know that that science, quote unquote, uh, and even sociology in general were created to justify the white racism that was needed in order to create domination of, of white folks over the, over the rest of the world, you know? So, so this is something that comes out of their culture. And again, this is all scientific. This isn't emotional. These, these are, these are not stupid people. You know, a lot of times people say, well, racists are just ignorant. No, they weren't they were very Blumenbach was, was not, was not ignorant. The German, mm-hmm. the German philosopher mm-hmm. and the German, you know, Linnaeus was, was not ignorant. Uh, J. Marion Sims was not, was not ignorant, mm-hmm. you know, and we can just go on down the line. So, so you have uh, these these things that are created just as capitalism created, I believe, uh, to justify and then to reify white uh, domination over the world. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and, and of yeah. course, there are certain classes of white folks, certain ethnicities of white folks, because they have hierarchy even among themselves. Uh, they had feudalist systems, you know, that that they basically just kind of brought over here and then it morphed into uh, enslavement. But so so this is what we're talking about. And that's, again, what Marimba Ani talks about in her book, Yurugu. Um, when she when she deals with uh, the Asili and the uh, Tamarujo, the, the 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 germ seed of a cu- culture, the ethos of a culture, if you will. Yeah. Uh, wow. Right. Okay. Um, 
uh, I'm trying to just, just obviously for somewhat for the sake of interest of time, there, there, there's, there's, mm-hmm. I wanted to sort of get to the point that you were, you were getting to, uh, with the squad at the beginning, by the way, one of the other flaws I think that I would want to raise with Frank, if we ever had a chance was when you're talking about the, the, the inability to develop coalitions, because even, uh, um, uh, um, you know, Palestinians or indigenous Americans or, or indigenous Americans, indigenous people in the what are now called the Americas uh, mm-hmm. or whoever else. I think there's one way of doing that. But when you're trying to make a, an argument about the inability for black people to actually engage in meaningful coalition, it, I don't think Frank does himself any 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 help by pointing to examples that involve white women. So, for instance, in this article, when he talks about the inability yeah. of, of for coalition, he talks about the issues around uh, um, anti-rape work between black and white women. Th- in that, Philadelphia, that, yeah. And, yeah I, that, that, that's not a good example. I mean, be, you know, be, first of all, the, the antagonism between white and black in this country, I don't think is a good um, uh, argument to, to use against the ability for coalition making, because that's almost too easy uh, uh, in terms of... of uh, um, uh, just just generally speaking it it just seems too easy of course white and black women are not <laughs> are going to struggle to work together in the context of a, of a, of a at best a white liberal feminist construct i get that uh i think he should have done more in this piece uh as he seems to be doing in the book i'm now reading if he wants yeah. to make this point to focus on the struggles between non white groups uh uh and black people to build coalition uh, well, to make his point, well, so look, that, that was I, another flaw. But 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 going to the other point yeah. real quick, he's writing this in the nation okay. to a white audience, so that's why I think he needed to use that example, which is again I think a problem that he is helping make for himself. But go ahead, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I you know, there, there's several other examples I think that he could have used other than that, um, mm-hmm. the one that he used. I mean, I think uh, to my earlier point, you know, as long as you echo uh, what what white people. Uh, uh, have hold sacred, and then you, you're good. You know, you're good. <laughs> but as soon as you start having an independent strand of thought, that's when you start falling out of rails. For instance, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. I heard you talking about being a vegan, uh, and so <laughs> forth. I've I've been a so-called vegan since 1995. Okay, <laughs> a black, a Negro from the South, who who grew up on hog maws and chitlins and and uh, now, I don't know and, how you and neck bones and, and all that. You know, so who 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 ate, you know, who used to hunt little animals and critters that we might see crawling around on trees and flying mm-hmm. around, you know, as a, as a young boy. I did all of that. Right. So 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 we talking almost 26 years now of, of doing this. One of the problems I've always had, and I know this this is a, this this is a, not the best example, but I'm just saying in terms of my in terms of my argument of, of echoing, you know, whiteness uh, and values. You know the black vegans that are that are that are lifted up are those ones that 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 do just that. But if if you talking about a a person that's coming from where I'm coming from as a black vegan, you know, from my perspective, where I'm arguing with them because they're telling me that you know they got time to save dolphins and whales and stuff, but they ain't got nothing to say when black folks are getting killed. All oh, well, that's not in our movement. Oh, that's not in our. You know, now mm. now to Wilderson's point, a better argument that he could have made that I thought he was going to get to when I was reading it about the white women was something that I remember about the women's march that took place after, uh, after uh, ah. uh, Trump was elected in 2017. When, when you had, the, when you had that, that fissure between um, black Tameka women, and Mallory, white women, because, black women because white women were getting yep. mad. That's right. They got mad because of white, because the black women kept bringing up race. Matter of fact, I was in an Uber on the way uh, uh, on, on the, on that, on that morning. And a white woman was in there and she was, you know, we were talking, it was making small talk. And she said, uh, yes, I do talk to white people. I'm not like a person to <laughs> talking to white folks to everybody who thinks that people who are in the culture are just like, oh, white people, you know. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm very comfortable with being African you. and I can, oh. I can walk in many, in many areas. Uh, you know, but so we talking and, and, I, and, and so I asked, she said, yeah, I'm a, you know, I just, she had just left. Matter of fact, she, she had just left the, 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 it was afterwards. She had just left the women's march. And so I, I said, well, how was it? Oh, it was it was fine. But there were just some 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 messages that I just think was just kind of, you know, just really <laughs> just taking us off base and this and that. And I said, well, what? And so I kept pressing her. She didn't want to say it for one. That's one. Th- and then she, well, I mean, people were kind of like talking about race and we we're really just talking about women's issues and blah, blah, blah. And I said, like, oh, OK, that's interesting. You know, I'm, I'm not going to argue with no white person over 
how they right, feel about right, right. you know hierarchy and all that. That's you know we again t- to your point about Frank Wilson. To me, that's making an argument to them. You know, I ain't making an argument to the white woman about her wanting to center her whiteness, her white womanness over dealing with black women's issues. You know, but I thought that could have been a better a better example that he could have used was 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 that particular case. That's a good point, uh, uh, especially now with where. Uh, Particularly, Tamika Mallory has found herself in this this debate around, um, uh, you know, who's representing the movement and all of that. That would have been, yeah. But again, he's not coming talking up to, slamming Cadillac doors, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> Me, Me and, and you. you. <laughs> oh, wait, by the way, Andre Benjamin's birthday was a couple of days ago. Oh, for real? Andre Benjamin's birthday was a couple of days ago. And shout out, shout out to Betty Shabazz. Her birthday is today as well. And uh, oh wow, my shirt. we didn't get the shirt game going. We got Mama. We got Mama Harriet up in here today. Oh, you know, word just, up. Uh, shout out to the sisters. Yeah, I'm just doing the... Yeah. the, the, the I, I also the go to Melon King and Apparel as, as well. I got that for Melon and Apparel. Right on. <laughs> shout out to Melon and Apparel. So, yeah, uh, I'm with you on the uh, Melon and Apparel. We do need to get... Yeah. Yeah, in fact, that reminds me. That's right. I forgot to contact. I was straight up going to reach out. I need to reach out and be like, hold up. So we got like a whole rack of people rocking your stuff on, on, on this network. Let's, let's work something out. Anyway. Um, real quick, uh, uh, uh mm-hmm. this is, this is the part in his article where, where it connects to the, to the point about the squad. Um, cause he talks about, uh, being initially excited at the way after George Floyd's killing, there was seemed to be this, this new fervor, uh, uh around defund the police uh, that involved, uh, a, a coalition of, of ar- anarchist, socialists, non-black supporters of black lives matter, et cetera. But then he says, but, but within weeks, the joke slipped back through my fingers like four decades of sand. For one hot summer moment, the cries of our allies had been authorized by the demand that black suffering embodies. And their political des- and their political desire was animated by a kind of black desire that is normally crushed between them and the state. That moment did not last. Abolish mutated into defund. Defund melted into delay. And the zeitgeist shifted from unfettered black rage to sober tutorials on activist websites and affinity gatherings on how to ma- massage a message that was already massaged to win the hearts and minds of middle Americans as they watched us being gunned down on Instagram and the news. Um, to your point, when you when we started about agreement, that uh, as much as anything he wrote here uh, resonated with me. Uh, and when we just saw last week on the anniversary of Floyd's killing, it was reported widely that while there were people out there protesting, the numbers weren't nearly the same. Uh, and then there was uh, this, there is this ongoing debate about the impact of the Chauvin trial and conviction uh, in 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 uh, calming uh, some anger. Um, by the way, this is why I think it's important that Dr. Joy James hooked up this. Uh, summit that we're hosting here on June 12th. So please make sure you all are coming back for that on a summit on accountability. Uh, but anyway, so I, I, you know, I, I, um, um, I don't know. Uh, there's one other thing I wanted to share from, from Frank's work uh, since I did just start to really read his book, uh, the new book, Afro pessimism um, that I, I would just want to share very quickly Uh uh, if I can, because um, it endeavors, uh, unlike the peace in the nation, an actual uh, definition of Afro pessimism. Um, well, you know, why, why you look? Yeah, why are you looking for that? Sure. Oh, you go ahead. Okay, go. No, no, go ahead. But go ahead. It's all right. Well, go ahead. Well, no, no. Why you looking? At, there was a one part that I, that I thought was interesting when he talk, okay, talked sure, about sure. universal un- universalism, and that's another thing that um, that that gets us hung up, in my opinion. When, when we have these uh, so-called coalitions, he said black members become refugees of the coalition's uh, universal agenda. And then skip me down. He says the way debate is bound within premises acceptable to non-black coalition partners, uh, limiting the scope of dialogue to those aspects of state violence and captivity that non-black coalition partners have in common with blacks. Our coalition partners simply telling us to stop playing the oppression Olympics. Yeah, um, yeah. And what, the, 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 but this notion of, of universalism, it, it it smacks of again the Western notions that that they give us. Oh, it's not just it's not you know it's not blacks uh, so uh, black uh, what sociologies sociologies is sociology. Oh, right. economics is just economics. This is just a universal principle. It's 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 unbiased. You know. Oh, it's just it's not it's just Christianity. It's, it's a universal religion. This is a universal. <laughs> you know. So. But what typically happens is that we go for the universalism, we go for the principles, we go for the ideologies, and we go full throated no matter what it is. And we and we tend to be the most 
uh, the, the the most passionate adherence to the to those ideologies. But very often the Europeans, the whites, you just typically use those as methods to get us uh, caught up. And and while while they keep going for power. And I think, uh, you know, going back to the to the to that piece about that you just read about uh, from from Wilderson. I think what's important in that is that we, you know, instead of being upset or sad that the white kids, you know, are falling off, you know, and, you know, kind of fueling his Afro pessimism, you know, we got to be comfortable with the fact that we're going to be the ones in the lead. And very often we, we, we'll probably have some allies. I mean, there's, there's no, you know, there's no, there's, there's no, uh, you know, there's, there's no, uh, 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 you know, you're not going to have, you know, everybody being certain, you know, a certain way. You go, of course, you're gonna have some some outliers, you know, from from different groups. But the bottom line is that we have to be we have to be comfortable and become comfortable with the fact that we're gonna be the ones who are leading this, and we're gonna be the ones who who are gonna be uh, the most passionate about it, and we're gonna be the ones uh, because and the reason is because we don't have anything to slip back into. You know, I grew up in in a place with a lot of white folks, eighty uh, some odd percent white people, and a lot of those people you know, were liberal and they listened to black music and they dated black people. And if you look at some of their social media pages now, as they get older, people tend to get more conservative and look, it's just easier to just be a white person and just kind of fall back in. So, uh, and, and that happened in the sixties, you had white folks that were out there and, you know, they were progressive as hell. And then by the eighties, you know, they became the David Horowitz. Uh, oh, when wow. I was, when we were coming up in the seventies, <laughs> yeah. when, when we were, when we were coming up in the seventies and eighties, you know, we had white folks. We probably, I'm probably, well, at least I know that I knew that were progressive and now they kind of falling back and become, so th the numbers will dwindle. And so we can't, we can't get so hung up on this coalition as to, you know, negate the fact that we have to be the ones in charge. Yeah, my only problem with that last point is that too many of my black friends went liberal too too liberal too. That was that's that's the that's the the, the but people yeah. people people yeah. tend to people tend to become conservative. I I was wearing a public enemy shirt one time and this brother this brother said, "Oh yeah, I was into all that stuff when I was in college." Yeah. Yeah, so so to your oh, point, wow. generally speaking, yeah. people in general will, but but white folks have it much easier though because they can kind of just escape back into into whiteness. Just like just like uh 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 people who were uh, Irish at one point, you know, they were, you know, you know, they they were they were they were sanctioned in a sense. Jewish people were sanctioned mm -hmm. in a sense. Italians mm -hmm. were sanctioned, ethnic whites were sanctioned, but at a certain point, they were able to kind of fall into being white, you know. So instead of being Jerome Silverman, you could just be Gene Wilder. Instead of being oh, Fred Ostrich, you can be Fred Astaire. You know, you, you you can change your name and you can anglicize your name and fit fit get in where you fit in. Yeah, I don't think I can do that. I don't, and matter of fact, I don't want to do it. You know, I want to be I want to be my own uh, the, the author of my own, you know, destiny. So now you went the other way. You 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 added Africanisms to yourself like you. You went the other way. You you, you know, quote unquote, made it worse for yourself. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but real quick, I did want to, you know, yeah, yeah, you definitely did. Yeah, you you you, you did continue to do so. Um, but one thing the, the the that I was interested in, and again, I've just started to read Afro pessimism. Uh, actually, last night is where I really started actually reading it, because um, uh, Dr. CBS was like, "You have to if you want to do this, if you want to de debate it correctly." And she was like, "I've read everything, so you better get ready." Um, but uh, uh, I'm scared of her anyway, man. I wouldn't. Yeah, oh, no question, no question. I definitely have messed up here. There's no, there's no doubt. <laughs> I'm scared about of. It. I'm scared of all the women. I'm scared of all the women on Black Power Media. I'm scared yeah, me of Kim too, Brown. Me too. I'm scared and, of Jackie and, Lukma. I'm scared and of Jackie, CBS. And I'm scared of Ayelle. Hold up, especially after I saw Jackie in person and re re was reminded at least recently of how short she is. Her, she got a low center of gravity. That's dangerous. You gotta, you 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 can't just you gotta be careful with, with the, the, the little people. I married a little person like that, so you gotta be careful. They they get a bunch of ha. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> They got leverage, bro. They got leverage, man. And, and, and anyway, and if you can get around Abdus to get to Jackie, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a mess. Anyway, so so anyway, I'm not I'm 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 scared of everybody. I've definitely you know, uh, uh, but I do believe that we need more discussion. And and to the point of the email exchange that we had, what well, wasn't an exchange? It was just 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 anyway. I I. I I just think it needs to be more discussion. That's all, and and I don't see you know. Well, I, don't know. well, well, part, yeah, anyway, well yeah. I think there, mm -hmm. there needs to be more discussion, but people tend to blow you off. You know, like they they tend to ridicule you, like they did with in, in that particular. Oh, that email definitely, absolutely. About. I got. I was like, damn. Yeah. All it's right, so, well, all right yeah. then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So check this out. Uh, uh, and, and by the way, I largely agree with all the people on that email. That's what I think is really the funniest part. Right, right. And, and have even some long histories with some of the people in that email. And, and I thought, but, the but again, was, was that's why, I, that's hell. why I yeah. said, that's why I said the idea that, that people become all, um, ideologues, man. It's almost, mm. it's, it's, it's ironically religious for people who claim to not be religious. That's, it, that's just what I found. The, that's right. what I found. So I just, let me at least just go through this, this, uh, uh, I did, I caught, I've been trying to avoid the comments in the chat. I did catch, uh, earlier and I appreciate th that they're here where, where Dev said, um, something, I thought something, I'll go back and look later, something about, uh, okay. Frank's problems with anecdotes, like his anecdotes aren't the, maybe the best, uh, that he could use. I think we've already spoken to some of that. One of the anecdotes he, he does use in this book that, that I honestly found compelling, even though the, I understand that the timing of it may not work well, given what the Palestinians are continuing to suffer. But, uh, uh, he talks about, uh, long story short, he's, he's uh, in the eighties being friends with, with a Palestinian who is, is he thinks he's in some sort of solidarity with until the Palestinian friend reveals that, that uh, as bad as it is uh, under the oppression of Israeli soldiers, it's worse when it's an Ethiopian Jew uh, who is, is performing the task of the Israeli police and military. Uh, uh, and so one of Frank's anecdotes, which, which I agree with Dev um, uh, often, I, well, at least in many cases, I think could uh, be better or, or or maybe maybe supplemented better. I don't know. Uh, this one actually resonated with me. Um, that 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 one resonated with me. This idea that at the end of the day, so many people continue uh, to see blackness as one level lower. Uh, but anyway, but his point here, his definition here is that Afro pessimism then is less of a theory and more of a meta theory. And previous in previous pages, he explains the meta prefix. Um, a discussion of something as opposed to, a, you know, a discussion of a discussion, like a meta discussion is a discussion of a discussion, as he says, it's not a, mm. dis, it's not a discussion of a specific topic anyway. So Afro pessimism then is less of a theory and more of a meta theory, a critical project that by deploying blackness as a lens of interpretation interrogates the unspoken assumptive logic of Marxism, post-colonialism, uh, psychoanalysis and feminism through rigorous theoretical consideration of their properties and assumptive logic, such as their foundations, methods, forms, and utility. And it does so, again, on a higher level of abstraction than the discourse and methods of the theories it interrogates. It is pessimistic, pessimistic about the claims and theories of liberation uh, the claims theories of liberation make when these theories try to explain black suffering or when they an analogize black suffering with the suffering of, of other oppressed people. It does this by unearthing and exposing the meta a priori, I don't even know if I'm saying that right, strewn like landmines and what these theories of so-called universal liberation hold to be true, to your point, uh, Kaba, about uh, uh, universalism. If, as Afro-pessimism argues, blacks are not human subjects, but are instead structurally inert props, implements for the execution of white and non-black fantasies and sadomasochistic pleasures, then it also means that at, uh, at a higher level of abstraction, the claims of universal humanity that the above theories all subscribe to are hobbled by a meta a por a por a poria, a contradiction that manifests whenever one looks seriously at the structure of black suffering in comparison to the presumed universal structure of all sentient beings. So it's, it's a heavy worded, you know, but essentially what I understand him to be saying is what you've somewhat already outlined and many others have in different ways for a long time is that <laughs> white people don't think black people are even human and therefore even their most radical theoretical approaches cannot be applied fundamentally to the condition of black people and can never be used as tools to free black people. Uh, that's how I yeah. at least interpret that. Um, yeah. I Look, think you can makes, use the tools. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, I, go ahead. I, I, you, you can use the tools from other people. I, I think sometimes people get kind of silly in my opinion when they start talking about, you know, <laughs> when they, when they are critical of, of folks like myself and they'll say that, oh, you know, whatever, you know, you, you can use tools from anybody from, you can use by any means necessary, whatever it is that you need to do in order to, uh, for, in order to establish, uh, you know, a system of, 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 of equity and liberation and, and so forth, 
uh, you can use that. You know, I just don't, I, for me, I just don't believe that we should be so uh, attached to any particular theory to the point where we start getting, you know, to the point where we start insulting people simply because they have a different perspective or, or a different point of view, you know, like the way you were dismissed or, or ridiculed uh, simply because uh, you you had some you 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 had some disagreements with uh, some of the folks in that particular. Actually, that, it didn't even that, get to that, that, that level. Across. It didn't even get to the level of disagreement because well, all you, I was asking for was you were dismissed. I was just like, could you it just was, lay there out was, your there argument? Wasn't a conversation. That's right. That's right. Yeah, there wasn't a conversation. You won't even have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Now you'll have a conversation on all kind of other things, mm -hmm. but but as as far as this is concerned, you don't want it for some reason in this in this instance, you don't want to have a conversation. You're, you're erudite all in in these other ways. If we want to talk about you know, Marxism or socialism, you, we, we can break that down. But all of a sudden, when it comes to this, now you don't want to talk, which is why I said from the beginning and I said before, and you dragged me into this, Dr. Dr. Ball, and I'm, <laughs> I'm starting to really, you know, not like you for this, which is why I tend to not even get into it because I've been doing this for a while yeah. and I know where it's going to go. And people, and I, I haven't seen the chat, but I can I can only imagine some of the stuff that's in there. It, it's, it's I, I bet you what I'm saying is demonstrated from 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 a certain segment of the chat i guarantee you and that's exactly why i try to stay away from that because i understand that people get real uh prickly about this this particular issue and i for me i just i i choose to avoid it not not to uh, you know to quote unquote keep the peace and and just be you know uh, uh, a flower child or something like that i do it because i just don't want to fight black people over white people I right. think that if we if you if you about liberation, I'm about liberation. Let's get that. If you want to use that theory to get there, that's fine. We can argue about all that when we're free, as far as I'm concerned. Right on. So we'll leave it there for now. Uh, I appreciate you joining me for that conversation. Let me drag you into this a little bit. I appreciate that. And and uh, uh, I'll, I'll work to recover our our friendship uh, going Dr. forward. Dr. Jared Ball. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I do think, you know, uh, and I look and I admit to and I have no problem with this. I admit to some uh, some of it. Somebody said you taking it personally. And I was like, yeah, I do take some of this personally when when people that I think uh, should know better and know me and, and know me long enough. Uh, and at this point, I don't feel like anybody is too big to talk to me. Like, I don't I don't. They may think differently, but I'm like, I don't give a damn. And if you email you're, me you're, in a group, who who are you to not get a response? You know what I'm saying? Like I didn't, and as I reminded him, I didn't ask to be in this group. You you emailed me. Don't email me if you don't. These want are me people to respond. that that. These are people that know your politics. They know where yeah. you're coming from, and yet, if if you have a slight disagreement, you're treated like a heretic. Yeah, you're treated. And I like will say heretic. this too. And some of them and on that email. That's my point. Some of them on that email group are damn trifling. And and I've told them to their face that they're trifling, and some of that's going to come out, you know, some of that. So I have, I'm waiting for some of that too. And they didn't respond at all in the email. They stay way quiet, uh, uh, and I think no better. So so I thought that was kind of interesting too. Like like anyway, man. Anyway, we we're taking too many L's collectively for anybody to be thinking they're too high up to be talking to anybody else. Uh, and 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 I don't mind saying, especially me, I put in enough work to get a response from some of you. Like, I'm I, like, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't appreciate any of that. Uh, so, but that said, uh, I do appreciate this. And I do appreciate the disagreements. I do appreciate uh, the principle, you know, whatever. And, um, uh, and I think to her credit, and I appreciate this as well, uh, Dr. CBS, who does not agree with me on this at all has said, look, do your homework and let's let's chop it up this summer. And I think that's that's as, as <laughs> appropriate as it can get. So, Kaba, it's nine o'clock. Let's take a quick break. Minister Server's in the building. And we're gonna come right back, do a little, a little, a little quick transition, come right back uh, and get to Minister Server and talk a little bit about some some uh, uh transition a little bit to some hip hop history uh uh, uh uh that most people I think have never heard. So let's get to that. Back in just a moment right here at I Mix What I Like Live Black Power Me. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What I like. What I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. 
Right on, right on. Back again. I mix what I like live. Jared Ball, Kaba, Akintunde, and Minister Server in the building. Uh, go to you, sir. I'm going to just quickly uh, uh, let everybody know that originally from Atlantic City, New Jersey, and part of the Renegade Culture crew here on Black Power Media, Minister Server Tavares is, among many other things, a dynamic hip hop cultural strategist with spiritual conviction, organizational skills, and a true gift of inspiring people to tap into their greatness. He is a committed leader with integrity, passion, and experience who has spent over 25 years dedicated to the development, growth, and preservation of hip-hop culture around the world. His much more extensive bio is right down there in the show notes of this show. Uh, and uh, but, but I just want to welcome him and thank you for joining us. Good morning, brother, Minister Server. Welcome. Good morning to you. Good morning, Dr. Jared Ball. Good morning, Kabbalah. Yo, great conversation, man. Great conversation y'all were having. Right on. Thank Good you morning. very much. Good morning. Um, Good morning. So look, man, yeah, you know, Minister Server, you know, we see you, you know, everybody watches Renegade Culture. We see you, you know, we, you come in with the good verses. I should have, man, that's what I should have done. I should have asked for him to drop a verse, yeah. one of the yeah. intro verses for us today. Damn. Anyway. Yeah, um, you, you got to ask him because you can't, you can't, you can't do another verse according woo! to some of the people in the chat. You can't do another verse. You can't do no more, no more. I got a verse for you. I got a verse. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, man. I was with you. I this ain't complex. I keep it mad simple. Minister Server transmitting from the temple. The Lord is my light and my salvation. I'm here to heal the whole hip hop nation. Word up. Right on. Salute. Hey, there it is. Right on. Uh, all right, all right. Yeah, we'll leave it to the experts, Kyle Bob. We'll leave it to the experts. I, you know, Big Daddy Kane, you know, get me all amped up sometimes. But, 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 yeah, uh, we'll leave it to the experts. So, like I said, I man, like, we, I like, I liked your rendition, brother. I thought it was good. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate. No, I said that. I liked your rendition. I thought it was good. Yeah. We had people in the chat talk yeah. about breath control and all that. I was like, get your expert asses out of here with that. That's like this. <laughs> They, they the remixes. That was the remixes. The remixes. The remixes. Uh, the, the the and the mix a lots. Maybe, maybe they wanted the raw remix because you know there was an original raw and then he had a raw remix. So maybe they wanted the raw. That's remix right. Maybe they the, wanted because the you but you spit the raw remix. So that was a remix. I don't know. I don't get it. I don't know, man. Anyway. <laughs> So, Minister Server, you know, we were when we we were taping uh, a Renegade Culture a couple weeks ago, and I th I can't remember where in, in one of the breaks you started talking a little bit about your 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 background and your your uh, work with the Temple of Hip Hop and KRS One, and it occurred to me, man, I haven't heard you know enough of your whole story, and uh, there's clearly a lot to it. Uh, so if if we could, let's start with some of the basics, and and you know, I, you say you started off in New Jersey, uh, but talk a little bit about you coming up and, and where you and the emergence of hip hop overlap uh, and in particular, how you've meshed this ministry component uh, and, and the work within the temple of hip hop. Well, uh, first of all, let me give a shout out to my renegade culture comrades, Kamal, Kalanji, the air doctor, Jaha. You know, they had to, you know, that that was part of the contract for me to say that before I got started. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but, um, yeah, man, you know, I'm uh, 56 years of age. So like most people, I was there for the beginning of hip hop before we even started calling it hip hop. You know what I'm saying? I, in high school, I was known as MC Dave T. When I went to college, mm -hmm. um, I was DJ Server. Uh, the name Server is actually my fraternity name, Omega South Five fraternity. Um, so I became DJ Server. Um, then once mm -hmm. I graduated from Wilberforce University, big up to Wilberforce University, side note, the first privately owned and operated black college in the country, in case you didn't know, 1856. Salute. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so when I graduated, I uh, moved to Atlanta. My uh, then girlfriend, later my wife, uh, was from Atlanta. So uh, I moved to Atlanta. And, um, you know, I, as I said, hip hop was just a part of my regular, you know, routine. So I, I started working in marketing. My, my, my undergrad degree is in uh, communication. So I started working in marketing and sales and things of that nature. Uh, but I, I used to teach like during the summers. But you know, like most young men uh, coming out of school, it's like teachers don't really make money. I mean, I'm not really trying to do that. So um, after working in sales and marketing and making a bunch of money, I just really wasn't happy. I wasn't satisfied. And um, as you said, I'm, I'm from Atlantic City, New Jersey. So I've seen money made legally and illegally my whole life. Uh, in fact, my mother hit the lottery for a million dollars when I was in college. So I've seen money my whole life. So I'm not, I'm not moved by money like that. So uh, once I decided to change careers, I started substitute teaching to see, you know, whether I was, it, I knew I wanted to teach, but I wasn't sure whether I had the, the background and all that kind of stuff to teach and, you know, the temperament, you know, students and all that. So of course, substitute teaching, that's front line, like dealing with them, they don't care nothing about you. They want to test you and all that type of stuff. 
So um, when I started teaching, one of the things that I would do, I would bring a source magazine and just put it on my desk. And of course, you know, students would see it and want to talk about it. I'd be like, nah, once everybody finishes their work, then we could talk about some of the things in the Source Magazine. So I kind of use that. Can as I a- just interrupt very quickly? Because the Source Magazine has a particularly important history to all of yeah. this. Uh, and I think in, in, in including the contradictions that we were already talking about, the white ownership, the white mm-hmm. editorial leadership, the, mm-hmm. the, the involvement from the beginning in white people setting what would be acceptable and, and popular. Uh, but it's undeniable, but the source started as a newsletter and then eventually mm-hmm. becomes this, this dominant magazine right. uh, uh, is an enormous uh, uh, piece of the history. So I just wanted to, you know, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, again, I, I started uh, teaching. And, and in fact, one of the things that's just also when Yo! TV Raps used to come on. Uh, so I used to tape, tape Yo! TV Raps. And on Friday afternoon, we would, after finishing the work, we would show videos and then have discussions after each video, you know, from the from the lady side, well, from the young lady side and the young men's side. So I was doing hip hop education before I even knew it was hip hop education. It was as a way to keep the young people engaged, keep them to do the work that they needed to do, but also connect them to the culture. Uh, fast forward, um, I started working with Nation Time Syndicate in 1992, which is the first hip hop collective in Atlanta. And you remember during that time, it was before, you know, Dungeon Family and all that. So the Atlanta sound was really the, the Miami bass sound. It was mm. really doing a lot of, you know, um, you know, the fast beats and things of that nature. And when Nation Time Syndicate. MC uh, Shy D. Big up to Shy D. Wow. No doubt. Big up to Shy D. It's my yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so, but, I'm from Florida. I'm from Florida. So we love okay. that stuff back then. Yeah. Man, listen, man. Yeah. We love it too, man. Uh, uh, Magic Mike, you know, yeah. all of them was just doing it. But we also wanted to make sure that it wasn't just about just rap music. So Nation Town Syndicate, we had a um we had the first Atlanta uh hip hop uh a newsletter magazine, we had the DJ collective, we had promotions, we had the whole collective. We were so far ahead of the game, but for us it was just really a matter of keeping the culture uh, alive. In fact, our motto was to um, uh, preserve hip hop culture and its art forms. That, that, that was our motto. So I worked with them, uh, started doing radio in 1999 uh, for WRG, Big Up to WRG in Atlanta, Radio Free Georgia in Atlanta, which is a community radio station, 100,000 watt community radio station. And uh, we had a couple of shows on uh, WRG. I started doing my own show called the uh, the uh, Katcha Zone, which was taking music from different artists. Like, you know, during that day, you could have 10 songs that was crazy, but you had to have at least one song that was talking about something, at least one song that was, you know, for the people. So I would highlight, you know, artists like Trick Daddy and people like that. Don't necessarily think of as conscious artists, but everybody has something to say. Consciousness is is one of those Mm. kind of terms that I think the industry tries to throw out to kind of divide us again. So um, in uh, 2000, um, uh, well, actually, in 1999, I started going to Hillside International Truth Center, uh, rest in power to uh, Bishop Dr. Barbara Lewis King, uh, who was the, the spiritual leader there, and started studying uh, New Thought metaphysics from a Christian perspective. And it was very, very interesting to me. Uh, my uh, spiritual background is so diverse, and I was raised um, uh, um, Baptist until I was about 13, started exploring. I had three older sisters, so my older sister's boyfriend was Muslim. So of course, you know, I started studying uh, Islam a little bit. At 20, I took my shahada and became Muslim, and um, and yet, um, you know, studying Islam, I studied, you know, from the from the Sunni side. I've been involved in the nation of Islam, the guys of Earth. So I've always been searching just to find my own path in spirituality, and finding that I just didn't need religion. You know what I'm saying? I just needed a, um, my own way of accessing the God within. So in 2000, when I went to ministry school, I specifically went to ministry school for the Atlanta hip hop community, knowing that it was a lot of people like me that wanted to access God, regardless of their religion, uh, path, regardless of whether they even had religion, want to know how to access, you know, the power within them so they can live life more abundantly. I don't know anyone that doesn't want life more abundantly. You know what I'm saying? So um, fast forward with that, in my third year in ministry school, in fact, my last quarter in ministry school, we were doing a youth conference. And we wanted someone that could speak to the youth and speak to the adults as well. Karen's one was at the top of the list. We didn't know whether we could get him and what was going on with that, but we sent the letter, an email. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the way that the universe works, according to Karen's one, and Jerry, you know Karen's, he's dramatic in everything that he does. It's mm-hmm. constant drama, whatever that he does. So, so um, when he got the letter, he said at that same time, well, well let me kind of go back. In, in 2001, 
um, KRS came to Atlanta with the Temple of Hip Hop. And for those that don't know, the, the Temple of Hip Hop is the movement that he started in 1996 to discuss hip hop beyond entertainment. That's when we started saying, um, uh, I am hip hop. Before that, KRS One was the one that said, rap is something you do, hip hop is something you live. And for those of us that were do during that time, without even knowing what that meant, we kind of agreed with that. We was like, word, you know, this is more than just rap music type of thing. Um, and uh, I always like to tell people, Nation Time Syndicate starts in 1991. The Temple of Hip Hop doesn't start in 1996. So I do believe that, you know, the work that we were doing was most certainly getting out into the universe as well. So like I said, KRS One was at the top of the list. Uh, he said at that same time, uh, in, in 2001, they came in and, and opened up a Temple of Hip Hop. It didn't go all that well because if you know Atlanta, Atlanta, we don't really get down with the star celebrity shit. In Atlanta, every nigga is a star. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Every nigga is a star in Atlanta. So, you know, sometimes, you know, the celebrity part, if you're looking for that, you may not. You know, I wanted to start singing, right? Everybody is a star. Everybody is a star. <laughs> uh, exactly. I was thinking the same that's thing. Our, that's our, that's our, that's our <laughs> team in Atlanta, bro. Believe that. So, so anyway, so that you know was a you know opening then the closing. So again, 2003, when we reached out to KRS One, he said that uh, you know God had told him that he needed to get back to Atlanta because his minister was in Atlanta. Hmm. So when we talked, he was like, "Yo, sir, I've been looking for you for ten years." Blah 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 blah. I'm like, you care about one? I even looked for me for ten years, but you know, go with the Temple of Hip Hop. His whole thing was that he wanted someone that could speak to it in a way that was common man without the celebrity part. You know, what I'm saying because sometimes people only hear what they want to hear from celebrities. They don't really get the message because they're looking at the messenger too much. So um, we we had him down for a youth conference, um, and then he asked me to be uh, one of his spiritual advisors and to be the national organizer with the Temple of Hip Hop. So we started going around, you know, telling people um, about the Hip Hop Declaration of Peace, which is a document you see back there, which we presented to the United Nations in 2001. And, uh, you know, for me, it was just an expansion of the work that I was already doing in Atlanta through Nation Time. So as I tell people, it wasn't anything new when I started working with Karen's when I just expanded the work. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was a dope experience. I worked with him from 2003 to about 2006 directly. Um, then um, I decided to, uh, I actually lived in LA for a period of time, we opened up a temple of hip hop in LA uh, mm -hmm. for a period of time. But, you know, again, you know, celebrities are celebrities and, you know, no diss to none of them, but they have their own mindset of, of how they want to operate. And as I tell people, Karen one was 17 years in his career as a superstar. He didn't need me to help him with his rap career. I was there for the beyond entertainment part. Well, let me ask, can I ask? Let me ask real quick about that, if I can, because mm -hmm. the the this is something I've always struggled with in terms of of this 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 history and this discussion. Uh, mm -hmm. That that um, this this question of what is hip hop in relationship to as as a as a the hip hop nation as a as a culture as a community to black people. And, and I've always and I've always struggled for years with this idea that I felt like there's been an attempt to 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 uh, create another euphemism to uh, suppress and erase the struggles of black people and give it a new name and, and start you know calling it the hip hop this and hip hop that and hip hop, uh, you know, uh, and, and it sort of took away from a focus on the struggles of the people who were the progenitors of, of the culture. So I was always wondering, like, what from your perspective? What? How does hip hop as a culture relate to the people? Uh, and then, and then, where does this 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 idea of 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 uh, the temple of hip hop come into? And then I know KRS ended up writing the hip hop bible uh, as well. So I was always, and I've always struggled with 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 what I've thought about that and in, in my relationship to 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 all. So, can you talk a little bit about how you all conceived or still do of of this thing called hip hop as it relates to? the actual community uh, or communities that produce it. Um, if I hope that made sense, but yeah, it did. It did definitely. Uh, and be, and before, you know, before you start, before you start that uh, minister server, unfortunately, I, as I told Dr. Ball, I got to, got to oh, jump off right. here. Cause I got to, I man. got another engagement. No, that's all good. Yeah. I, I was, I was enjoying the conversation and I really didn't want to leave, but I got to jump off of here. Uh, it's an honor. And, and we got to do this again where I could get in here and have a more, uh, you know, a conversation Absolutely. with you as well. Server. So I, I, but I'll be back next week. Oh, you know, so, uh, We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll do we'll definitely it. chop it up again sorry but I, I keep i got i got all excited though you, nah, that's cool. you had more time my bad man thanks for joining no, us no, man no. God, i appreciate you appreciate man. all right you, yes sir yes sir all right peace. Take care, man. peace 
Uh, but yeah, sir, if you, yeah. If, if we, you, you know, go ahead and, and talk a little bit about that, if you would, this, this, uh, hip hop black community yeah, nation thing. Me, you know, and, and again, you know, I can only speak from my point of view and, and I teach from my point of view and I allow people to have their point of view. Uh, for me, hip hop is black African at its core. You know what I'm saying? From the ancient elements to what we're doing now, there's nothing new that we're doing that our ancient African ancestors have not already done. Uh, but we do know that there was a, a unique period of time that brought all those elements together in the, the late 60s and early 70s when we, you know, we, we count our history as, as um, uh, August 11, 1973 with Cool Herc. And again, you know, you know that history is told by those that document and tell their story. You know what I'm saying? So that's part of it. Um, my challenge with those that try to do what you talked about, to, to move the blackness and the Africanness out of it, is that shit is whack. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to be down with hip hop, you got to be down with not only uh, African people, but black people and the struggle that hip hop manifests itself out of. If you, if you don't have that part, you might as well just keep doing rap. You know what I'm saying? You don't really need to, to really deal with the culture. Um, as far as the hip hop nation goes, um, I think that, you know, that's just a fanciful dreaming at this point and, you know, projection. Uh, we we are, are a baby culture. According to the United Nations, hip-hop is the fastest growing culture in the world because the culture itself allows people to express themselves through the different elements uh, outside of any kind of system that, without having to get permission from anyone to do it. Now, of course, when you get into the, the business and the entertainment side, then you, you know, get involved with, you know, this hip-hop corporation and this hip-hop culture. You know, hey, I don't want to. I don't want to keep interrupting as slow as that. But I just taught a yeah, class yeah. on this, and my students didn't even know this basic history. So when you mm -hmm. mention the elements, yeah, what are the key elements? Uh, uh, and I know KRS helped expand them, but 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 yeah. when you talk about the, the the core elements that that comprise hip hop culture, even as recognized by the United Nations, what are they? Breaking, MCing, graffiti, DJing, knowledge itself. Those are what we call the, the foundational principles. Then, of course, through the Temple of Hip Hop, we added uh, beatbox, fashion, language, uh, entrepreneurialism, health and wellness. So we actually uh, operate in what we call 10 elements. And, and we talk about, again, you know, to me, that there's future elements that's going to be added. I think there should be an element that deals with uh, photography and videography. Those are elements as well. So again, I know, had argued for a hip hop journalism category. Yeah. Maybe that's part of the same thing. It well, well, that, would, that would that would actually go under language and knowledge. You, ah. know, saying, that, you know, journalism, right? So again, you know, it's like you know, we are growing, and as I tell people, particularly people that are really passionate about the culture, we have to put ourselves in context of history and time and space. If we're less than fifty years old as a culture, we're not even a blip on the timeline. Regardless of what we think we've done and who we think we are, we're not even a blip on the timeline, we're adding on to what has already been done. And you can see a direct link from ancient Africa all the way through our struggles, through the uh, civil rights movement, through the black nationalist movement, to where we are now. Now, again, some people have different perspectives on that, and I allow people to say it, but what we say is that you can look at our results of what we say. It's not just saying it, and I, and I use myself in my life as a prime example. When I say God is hip hop, let me get a plug right here. God is hip hop, you know, uh, let me do it again. God is hip hop uh, through a higher infinite power healing our people. That's what we're talking about. Whatever your personal names, I tell people, even when I finished ministry school, I never had any illusions of saving people's souls and doing all the stuff that, you know, so-called ministers and reverends and imams and rabbis do. I simply, I'm a, I'm a teacher. I'm a counselor at my core. So everything that I do is from the perspective of individuals being able to better themselves and making choices that are going to be good for them. And hip hop for me is just the perfect vehicle to do that. Um, the uh, Temple of Hip Hop, you talked about the gospel hip hop. Um, that book is the gospel, presented, that's right now. Sorry. Yeah, the gospel hip hop. That book is presented by KRS One, but it wasn't just written by KRS One, it was written by myself and a few others that added to it. And what the gospel hip hop really is, is part. Um, hip hop history. It talks about some some uh, key meetings. Like there's an actual transcript about one of the meetings of, of the mind uh, in, in uh, um, 1989, 90, like around the time of the Stop the Violence movement. And uh, if you remember, you know the blockbuster song that we had. There was a meeting of uh, what we should do with the money from the proceeds. And so there was uh, the Stop the Violence mm -hmm. uh, movement, movement in track. Yeah. That was a mm -hmm. posse track of all some of the. I so, mean, the everybody, right? Self-destruction, everybody, everybody who was everybody was on the joint. Uh, and by the way, I still love the way Public Enemies part comes in at the end where they change up the beat. And we learn to earn, we live for the love of our people. I, I love that whole, anyway, but but 
go ahead. But I just but yeah. th there was also this meeting of the minds that doesn't right. get a lot of attention or a lot exactly. of uh, memory. So please talk. I want you to say more about that. So, so, so at that time, along with the artists that were actually uh, a part of the Stop the Violence movement, you know, uh, Heavy D, Zesta Sonic, MC Light. Rest in um, Peace, Rest in Power, Heavy D. Rest in Power, Heavy D, uh, Just Ice, um, you know, again, uh, D-Nice, Miss Melly, all the people. It was a conversation of, okay, what should we do with the fund for the South the Violence Movement? And there was some that was advocating that we need to get some land, we need to get a building so we could teach what we teach. And there was some like, no, nah, we need to, you know, um, put it put it back into the artists and the other. Long story short, they end up giving the money to the Urban League over $500,000 to the Urban League. Exactly, Jared. That was my response, too. Because later on, just a side note, later on, the Urban League was one of the ones that was out running over CDs, trying to ban hip-hop and all that. So again, you know, we are growing and learning in that. Um, so with the, the Gospel Hip-Hop, I said, it's part historical, part uh, uh, philosophical. You know, Karis one has been calling himself the philosopher for forever. So it's, it's, it's a lot of different theories of what hip-hop can be, but it's also part prophetic. And what we believe hip hop can be, and it's like with the de declaration of peace. That's not the way hip hop is now. But where there is no vision, the people will perish. You have to have a vision of what you want to be, not necessarily what it is right now. You know, scripture says that we have to speak of things that are not as if they are. You know what I'm saying? So again, bringing those kind of uh, uh, backgrounds to it, you know, just adds a whole different nuance to it. And also because within hip hop culture itself, every spiritual path that you could think of already exists. So I remember prior to the book coming out, people were like, oh, KRS is trying to create a new religion and trying to make hip hop religion. That, that's not the case at all. It's still not the case. Uh, I don't, and um, I know sometimes the temple of hip hop can come off a bit cult-ish, <laughs> and uh, which is why one of the problems that, that I had, this is why I kind of distanced myself from the actual work. Because again, you know, if you're following around any person um, and you're not aligning yourself up with groups of people, like I believe in a collective consciousness, you know what I'm saying? Um, which is why I appreciate you and the work that you're doing with Black Power Media and all the things that we're doing, because no no one person has all the answers. It's us that represent the people. We should be listening to the people, staying in tune with the people. So, um, um, Let me, as, okay. well, I was going to ask, in, in terms of being in tune with the people, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, is you know, again, uh, speaking off my experience in the classroom primarily, uh, which is honestly the the my only routine engagement with uh, um, this amount of black youth at that you know particularly in that age range in, the, in this this college age range, they don't seem to have uh, an appreciation collectively or an understanding of of not only hip hop history but hip hop as its own sort of. Um, I don't know whether, you know, a movement or approach to a movement or a doorway into a movement. They don't really, you know, so when I was asking them this past semester, like, you know, do phrases like hip hop activists mean anything mm -hmm. to you? Do you know the four, the four, at least the four original elements, things like that? They really didn't, none of it. So, I'm, I, you know, so in terms of where you see the people going or being pushed or forced to go, uh, where do you see hip hop? And it and and the work you've been describing here, uh, interacting with these with these, or how they're or how are they interacting with these histories? From Great your question, and and I agree one hundred percent. You know, um, as I tell people, you know, my newest title is the dopest hip hop grandpa ever. You know, what I'm saying? That's, my, <laughs> that's my new title, the dopest hip hop grandpa ever. And I'm challenging people to come for the crown. Everybody trying to get the crown, but I say that because we are multi generational in hip hop. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So I like to think of us in, in, in three kind of generations generally, uh, the 40 and older, the 39 to 25, and the 25 and under, generally. Um, so when you look at the 40 and older, our peers, a number of times, we kind of turned away from the culture because of what started happening in the rap music entertainment industry. So when we begin to turn away from it, not only did we turn away music-wise, we turned away culture-wise, meaning that we did not share with our children how we became who we are. And, and I challenge my peers, and, and I know, you know, I have people that, are, you know, doctors, lawyers, professors, rocket scientists, and who they are, hip hop culture during, during the 80s and 90s played a huge part in us identifying who we were and who we wanted to be. You know what I'm saying? It, it played a huge part in that. But, you know, as you know, during the mid 90s, when the um, FCC deregulated, you know, uh, um, media and whatnot, and people could buy up these these uh, media outlets and the the, the um, 
the major labels started buying up the, the independent labels and we saw a shift. So then we saw a shift from um, the cultural aspects, you know, being highlighted where you could have groups like Public Enemy, X-Clan, uh, uh, BDP and MC Light and Queen Latifah, not only with the lyrics, but the images that they were projecting, you know, particularly X-Clan, you know, big up to my brother, Paradise, um, who was still doing great work with the Universal Hip Hop Museum. So there was always these different type of things. So when the when the, the industry shifted, some of us didn't. We stayed with the culture, you know what I'm saying? And that's what I tell people. For me, I look at hip hop culture like any other culture. You know, um, you have to desire to be a part of it. You have to choose to be a part of it. It's like black people. Some black people know nothing about black culture because they just choose not to. You know what I'm saying? So it's funny you said that because just just not even I think three two or three days ago I showed my daughters a couple X Clan videos because because I, I keep trying to like they're constantly wanted to ask like basically you know how did you <laughs> how did you end up being like you exactly and I'm like well, you got to look at I was like look at this That's this was on cool. regular rotation regular rotation you could come home from school at afternoon and see images like that regularly. So again, you know, that's one of the challenges that I have with the 40 and older, that we're hypercritical of the young people, but I'll take it in context, the part that we play for them being the way that they are. You know, we, we again, were the ones that said, it takes a whole village to raise a child. But, you know, besides our individual fans, we kind of gave up on that concept, you know what I'm saying? So then we see the end results of that. But when we look at it, um, you know, on the, the flip side, there are some young people as your daughter that are curious, well, how do we become how do we become who we are? And they are interested. And my thing is, I'm I'm, I'm a father of six children. I have children from the age of 36 to 19. So the way that I teach young people, the same way I teach my children, you can't keep young people from listening to their music. You know what I'm saying? The music that is in their contemporary time. You can try to, but we all know as parents that if you try to do it, you're gonna make them love it even more. You're gonna make them run toward it. So I, I never tried to keep my children from doing it, but because I was still involved in the culture, I would have real conversation with them. And I would also, in the background, play music that they would hear without trying to even beat them down. And for our children, they are our children. You know what I'm saying? They're going to adapt and adjust to, to what they've been taught. You know, our responsibility is to raise them in the way that they should go. You know what I'm saying? And I think a lot of times we just didn't do that. And then when the entertainment industry kind of took over, uh, then we started blaming the entertainment industry and our youth instead of looking at ourselves. You know, so I said, you know, when, I, when I'm talking to my peers, I don't care what rappers you like or what rappers you don't like. I'm not really interested in that. I'm interested that the, the system is trying to kill our youth and they're using rap music as part of a way to divide us from them. So if we're leaving them out there and we're wondering why they are making some of the choices that they're making and the music sounds the way that it sounds, we have to take our own responsibility in that as well because we know that the entertainment industry, uh, the radios, those things are still controlled by the people at the level we want to control them. Now, if we advocate if we advocate control and allow them to do what they do, then they're going to do what they do. As I tell people, the enemy is always the enemy. Never forget that. No matter how uh, cool that they try to be, no matter how down they try to be, they are not with us. And when I say us, I mean black people specifically. Now, of course, as Africans, and through hip hop, we do what Africans always do. We share with the world. That's our nature to share with the world. But as far as moving into things of that nature, um, it, it has to be, in my opinion, coming from a, a African, a Black African perspective, for it to be really effective. Uh, because when it's when it's good for Black Africans, it's good for the world. Amen. How about that? Uh, um... Anyway, we're talking to Minister Server here. Uh, I Mix What I Like Live, Black Power Media. Appreciate uh, uh, all of you who have joined us. Please do consider hitting the like, share, and subscribe and join buttons. Uh, and if at all possible, to become a member by click, clicking the join button, help us ex continue to expand here as a channel. And then, of course, you get some, some gems like the uh, members only Black Liberation Army conversation we just had. Uh, a soldier story part one uh which was just bananas uh so please uh, you know become a member if you can and then avail yourself of that 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 privileged gift otherwise please at least like share and subscribe and do invite your friends family foe foes as well uh to check out uh, uh, uh what we're trying to do here um did do well to what extent do you do you think um 
I actually did want to ask you, you know, the, the, I mentioned that hip hop activist phrase that for a long time was being used uh, mm-hmm. and debated. Uh, I remember I was uh, in a very minor way involved with some of those debates trying to 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 uh, um, connect the phrase to actual political struggles and movements so that didn't get lost in that vague uh, sort of description. And um uh, part of that debate was in, in terms of what people di- where p- people disagree with me, at least, was this idea that hip hop has helped uh, with, as some have said, tanning the tanning of America and uh, 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 an opening up of America to make it better, you know, and, and helping, for instance, in a, in a positive sense. Again, I don't agree with this, but in a positive sense, bring, getting Obama elected and getting other black faces in high places and making it easier for the world to accept seeing black and brown people in positions of prominence. Uh, where are you on the, the spectrum of that, that discussion or that debate? Um, as you've seen hip hop go from not even existing into where it is today. D- 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 anyway, where are you yeah, on I, think, I think, you know, again, um, I think for the, for, for the most part, um, we just don't take ourselves serious. Like we don't understand the power that we can actually will. So we, uh, you know, and, and, and again, because we are a young culture, we are just kind of learning. Um, you were part of the, the initial uh, hip hop political convention in uh, 2004. I wouldn't say I was a part of it. I just attend, I mean, I was just there. Okay. But, okay. Yeah. And you know, so again, you know, um, we, we had this conversation uh, off air on the uh, renegade culture. Uh, people like yourself, uh, most certainly we need those voices because again, it, it has to be voices that help us to kind of shape where we are. So with the 2004, it was a lot of hype. It was a lot of, you know, you know, uh, people there because it was the first one and um, we didn't get a lot done besides making connections that could actually, um, we had what they call local organizing committees mm-hmm. that were supposed to go back to their city. Uh, we had different delegates from, I think, out of, out of 50 states, I think we had like 38 states that uh, sent people there to the convention. Um, I think because we have this mindset sometimes that we want things to happen quickly, that we don't see the long view all the time. And I think that's what happened with the National Hip Political Convention. We had the 2004 Hip Hop Political Convention in Newark at Rutgers. Then we had the um, 2006 Hip Hop Political Convention in Chicago, 2000, uh, it's 2006, 2008, we had it in Las Vegas. And that was the last one. Now, do you remember Las Vegas? I mean, in 2008, that was the year that uh, Cynthia McKinney and Rosa Clemente, big up to both of them, were running on the Green Party. I know you were involved with the, with the Green Party during that time as well. And for me, it was a, it was a great opportunity for hip hop to establish itself politically. But also at that time, we had Senator Barack Obama that was running for president. It was so historical. And we got caught up in the hype of the first uh, black president, blah, blah, blah. And even at the convention, I remember Deruba uh, being at the convention and laying the whole thing out. Like he, you talk about a prophet. You know Deruba, man. Deruba has a site that is just, I, I can't even describe Deruba. He's so uh, beyond you know anything that's happening, in my point of view, politically, from the uh, black African perspective. He's so on point. He's so, you know, um, internationally worldly that he could speak to things because he experienced so many things. But he talked about uh, Barack being uh, sort of like a Trojan horse and, and don't don't believe the hype and all those type of things. And I remember um, uh, George Martinez, who is, uh, was the first elected official out, out of New York for hip hop. I remember him and Reverend Yearwood got into a heated debate uh, over there. And, uh, I remember Yearwood, that. Yeah, for Reverend Yeah, well, for those that don't know, uh, represents the Hip Hop Caucus. And, um, you know, so they were supposed to be like the, the lobbying uh, wing. Yeah, it's a whole nother um, a show and, and conversation. Um, so there was a lot of conversation. But after that, we, we kind of literally imploded at that, uh, at that uh, convention. And we have not yet reconvened. Like I said, things are going locally. You know, I'm here in Atlanta involved in a lot of things locally. But uh, we have not yet convened. Now, my hope is that we will convene, that we'll, we'll at least begin to have those kind of conversations. I don't think that the uh, Democrats, the Republicans, um, even the Green Party, I don't think that they look at hip hop the way that we look at it. No. So um, I, I think there should be that more vigorous dialogue on what happens uh, politically. The whole hype of Barack Obama uh, being a hip hop 
uh, president is just straight up bullshit. We know that. No, bullshit. and in fact, I got to give, I, I don't even, I don't think they exist anymore, but there used to be a thing called Free Speech Radio News. And there was a journalist that worked there that at the time, uh, because of my, 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 my earlier campaign in the Green Party, had actually described me in print as the first hip hop presidential candidate, right, which exactly. I thought was pretty cool. Uh, but that obviously didn't last long, didn't go anywhere. Um, and I was happy to step back to support Cynthia and Rosa. Now, my memories of that 2008 Vegas conference, I was not there, but I heard about it. I got some of the audio aired it on my show at the time between Martinez and Yearwood. Um, was that that Martinez, who who I believe was running locally uh, uh, as a Democratic Party candidate in his community, mm -hmm. uh, if I remember correctly, was still making the argument that it was. Um, I may be I may be miss my memory may not be uh, on point here, but but or I may be conflating some things, but but I remember the argument being about. Uh, the influx of nonprofit money into the hip hop exactly. community and into electoral politics. And this is where mm -hmm. I and Lennox Yearwood had a huge falling out. Uh, and even more recently, uh, a couple of years ago, I had to, I had to break, I had to sort of bust up a meeting we were all in uh, to, to, to put on the table that I thought, I thought dude was doing some shady stuff. I thought there was a lot of problems with how he was moving. Um, uh, uh, and, and, um, uh, but but I thought that Yearwood had become one of the largest proponents of bringing in nonprofit money uh, and now moving even more into the environmental justice argument where a lot of money comes in and walking uh, his audiences away from actual political organization and certainly being able to move left of the Democratic Party. So that was always my argument yeah. and the problem that I had. And, and I'll and, and I'll stop here by saying and, and pitch it back to you that I think that moment and I, I hope you're right that there is a reconvening because I think that moment in 08 uh, sort of crystallizes the problem that is still here uh, and has even just grown that this influx of nonprofit money of Democratic Party money that funnels into the, our so-called movements uh, uh, and is and then is is sort of um, distilled through some very even talented and capable spokespeople who confuse mm -hmm. things even more is a real problem. And I thought that yeah. moment uh, really highlighted that that uh, sort of a turning point of sorts in, as it relates to hip hop. Anyway, most certainly. And and you know again, and, and even in that, you know, um, you know, this is America, so it's like capitalism is at the root mm -hmm. of of everything, in my opinion. So. Um, when they started throwing money at these different groups, like I said, it started, you know, it was probably before that when when, when um, Diddy had the, the vote or die campaign and That's you know, right. things like that, you know, so it's, it's, it's been different times. But in 08, with Barack Obama, it was a whole nother way. And it my, was a wild moment, man. <laughs> right. And also, this is, this is when, you know, the um, internet started really taking off and things of that mm -hmm. nature, which is why Barack was able to tap into that as well. So, you know, the, these conversations, I think, are ongoing conversations. Um, Reverend Yearwood and I have conversations all the time because, again, to me, um, initially, if if they're going to be the political lobby group for hip hop, uh, in, in, in in DC, they're not doing enough. They're not. They're not. They're not speaking for others. Then, like I said, when they moved to the environmental shit, I was like, well, what is that? Like, I mean, not that we don't care. I have children, so of course we care about the environment. But that's not front line for us. But that's not. But it's also. But it's also a, a straw uh, uh, setup because it's, of course, not that we don't care about the environment. But it's that. It's that. That's where all the white foundation money is going. Exactly. So that's why a lot of even elite alternative media uh, focuses so much on environmental issues and not on so many of these other issues that actually are connected. For instance, I, for instance, if you, for instance, one example is if, if you cover the, the struggles of the move movement you get black liberation and the environmental struggle all in once, but that's, so, so, but they don't want to do that because Definitely white not. elite foundations don't care about that stuff. They don't, you know, and it's safer for them, by the way, I just want to say this real quick. And if anybody hasn't seen it, please go and watch on YouTube, Michael Moore's executive produced the planet of the humans documentary, because I think to connect these two strands, what he shows in that documentary is that there's so much environmental money going around because these environmentalist groups are funded by the same fossil fuel energy groups that are presenting their their wow. environmentalist work as an alternative to fossil fuels. When in reality, all of this stuff from uh, electric uh, uh, cars to um, 
Solar paneling all requires heavy extraction from the earth, heavy extraction of fossil fuels. And of course, when you plug in your car to charge it overnight, it's still plugged into the electrical grid of the community, which is still run on fossil fuels. So it, it becomes this hustle shell game where people can say, but we'll spend a lot of money to get you talk about the environment because uh, every, uh, you know, all of that work is going to end up supporting the same banks and, and elite nonprofits and fossil fuel uh, industries in, in the long run anyway. So yeah. I think there's a parallel here in, in terms it definitely of... definitely is. Anyway, so, but anyway, it, go, I, I, yeah. Yeah, and you know, I, I mean, you make an excellent point because again, those those type of things, when, when you connect the dots, that's one thing I, lo- I love about your work and and i've been a fan of your work since doing those stuff. when i first heard of you in fact when i first heard of you is it, it wasn't a conversation of the first hip-hop political um uh, uh, pre- presidential candidate it, it was in that, that vein i was like well who was jared ball i see before even talk to jared ball i was like well who's jared ball then started finding out about that it was like word but you know again i think a number of times because of the influx of the corporation side of hip-hop you know like it's like um like, like even when I was working with, with KRS One, you know, I don't mind playing the back. I'm not one of those ones that need to be out front. But you know, KRS One and, and others wanted to make me like Bishop Don Juan. You know, you know what I'm saying? Well, I'm like, dude, that's not what it is. And I, and I tell people, you know, Chris is my brother, love for life. Hey, hey, Taj Lee, cut the air for me, please. Um, uh, you know, I love Chris for life, but I tell people I was 39 years old, married with six children. When I started working with KRS One, so it was right. never a fan thing. And I tell people, KRS One and I weren't homeboys like back in the day. Nah, we came together for spiritual, cultural, and political reasons. And I never forgot that. And I tell people, particularly Temple Hip Hop members, because sometimes you know I I, I kind of stand outside of it because while I am the Temple of Hip Hop, I don't represent the Temple of Hip Hop. I'm not a member of the Temple of Hip Hop. I am the Temple of Hip Hop, and mm-hmm. there's nothing that can change that KRS or no one else because the concept of being hip hop is not exclusive to the temple of hip hop, and, and KRS is of course the one that said, "I am hip hop." Right, right. Exactly. I don't do it; I am it. Right, and and, and you remember when KRS said it? I tell people when KRS said that back in '95, most was like, "What the fuck you talking about? What do you mean you are hip hop?" I mean, we were highly, I know I was highly offended. Like, what do you mean by that? You know, what I'm saying, but then you know the breakdown of you hear people saying, "I am a bunch of things now," so it made sense, you know. So Chris. You know, as a teacher, and I tell people with all this crazy, those of us that are old enough to know, Chris Ben Nutty from the door. He's yeah, I was going to ask you about that because, like, do yeah, you ever get? Yeah. Do you ever? Do you ever feel like uh, uh, you have to suffer some sort of negative association for something that he's done? Like, <laughs> maybe work with you know, going on Alex Jones' show back in the day, or or, or something else. Like, you have to, you know, be yeah, responsible yeah. for for KRS. You know what? Not only KRS one, but Africa Bambala too. Let, let me oh, no, yeah, I was, yeah, I was gonna add, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, man, I, I listen. I, I try to be as transparent as possible publicly. My private life, my private life, but publicly, I, I, I don't say anything pri- privately that I can't say publicly about people. Um, so yeah, um, KRS one with the Temple of Hip Hop most certainly could be a challenge for some people. Um, uh, Africa Bambada with the Zulu Nation could be a challenge for, for some people, but I tell people about both of them, um, their personalities are their personalities. What, what I work well, with, to me, there's a difference though. We gotta, I, we gotta, because KRS difference. is a personality, right. Bambada is accused of sexual violence and right. abuse exactly. against young boys. So, I mean, that's exactly. that's, that's and, a whole and, right, that's a whole nother thing that you know, again, you know, even that that that, that, that conversation, the way that we dealt with it from the Zulu Nation, in my opinion, it has still not been properly handled, you know, in my opinion. So, yeah. It has not been. With, with, with Karis One, it's a bit different because Karis One is, is a philosopher. And I tell people he has these different theories. He loves to talk. He loves to be out front. He, he loves to 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 teach. You know, he he again he called himself the teacher on criminal minded when he was living in a homeless shelter with four hundred people. He <laughs> called himself the teacher. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so. Dude is one of the most unique people that I've met. I ain't got nothing but love for Chris. We disagree on a bunch of different things. Um, and yet, uh, as I tell people, I don't have to agree with everything that you do. In fact, we talked about off camera before about when Kalanji and I first met. You know, my brother Kalanji, who we've been rocking hard. But when I first met Kalanji and Professor Grip, they was on some ambush. It was on the Bible Appreciation <laughs> Week. I was moderating a panel, and both of them were on a panel. So, you know, as a moderator, you want to stay, you know, open and, and objective. But but Griff and Clyde was like, fuck all that I am hip hop. I'm blackity, blackity, black, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, so after it was over, 
like I said, I didn't really know Kalanji because he had just come to Atlanta maybe about a year. So I'm like, this young, you know, firebrand, you know, riot starter, whatever. You know what I'm saying? But Griff, I was like, yo, Griff, if it's something that you want to say to me, we don't have to do it on a panel. We could talk, you know, brother to brother, you know. So, um, in fact, you know, later on that same year, there was a um, – a conference for in Cobra. For those that don't know, the National Coalitions for the uh, Reparations of Black People. Blacks for Reparations, uh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Blacks for Reparations, yeah, in Cobra. And uh, Griff and I were on the panel together. And prior to that, I was telling Griff, I was like, "Yo, Griff, um, I'm not the moderator this time. So if 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 you want to have that conversation while we're on the thing, we can have it. We can have it now before we get in there." So Griff's challenge was with KRS One. He heard, he, he saw a video where KRS was telling black children. You don't have to be black anymore. You could be hip hop. You know what I'm saying? I remember that actually. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I was, yeah. I was like, Chris said come on, man. Outrageous things. And I've heard Chris say some of the craziest shit. And afterwards, as a minister, I was like, "Yo, Chris, that's crazy. <laughs> Why would you say that?" You know, we, we said those kind of conversations all the time. Um, but I was telling Griff that you know, again, you know, breaking down, and, and that's one of the main reasons why KRS hired me to do what I was doing, to take his craziness and kind of help it make sense to the regular people that they can kind of get it. You know what I'm saying? Um, that didn't always work because again, people see celebrity how they see celebrity, even within the temple hip hop itself. Like uh, I tell people, I'm not, I don't run around trying to flash my resume and tell you all the things I've done, all the people, I, I, I don't do that because I take my time as a server, seriously. I, I'm just here to serve, you know, I, I don't really need all that. My grace comes from me serving, from my creator, from my ancestors, from my people. That's how, you know, that's the way that I get fulfilled. But in that same end, um, don't discount the work that has been done. You know, don't don't act as if because you're a celebrity or who you think you are, that that holds any more weight than the people that may not be as known, but actually doing more work than you. Don't, don't, don't let, me ask, let me ask you a question, given your experiences with Griff, because I... I and, and I, I was hoping we could have even gotten to it when he was joining us on the remix, but we just don't have time for it. And maybe we'll get a chance. To, uh, I'll ask him directly at some point. But 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 when I watched that thing with him and Nick Cannon. First, I was glad he came on the remix and, and made the point that that had been taped like a year and wow, earlier. Mm -hmm. But my initial thought was after the taping, I felt like. Honestly, I felt like Griff could have gone over or should have gone over to Nick and said, brother, don't ever air that. You, you're you not ready for this. This isn't your fight. Uh, the things that were said in this clip are going to bring you a world of trouble that you're not ready for and that you honest. And this is really my point that you aren't prepared, maybe even capable of being a spokesperson about. Yeah. In other words, so so all of that stuff with Nick getting, you know, first, you know, uh, 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 fired and 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 you know, and then dragged for apologizing to the Jewish community and all of that. I was thinking the whole time he shouldn't have been put in the position where he had to deal with any of that because that's not him. He's not he's not politically prepared for that. And I thought, and I just thought of that moment. Not that celebrities need me to feel sorry for them, but in that moment, I thought, man, Griff should have just been like, man, I'm I'm the expert here. I've been in this struggle. I've already suffered the you know what 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 you're going to have to deal with and you're not prepared for i'm the you know anyway i just thought he should have said man i don't think you should air this and, but see, and but see, you know, yeah anyway you, go ahead yeah during that time you know nick cannon was trying to set himself up as a black leader so if you want that's you know, true if too. you want that energy you're right. You're right. And, you, and you have griffin again you know griffin's been clear on who he is and has yeah. a way, even what you know being labeled anti-semitic and all that yeah they consistent that's why i tell people one thing that like I said when, when griffin and i initially met it was a it, it was a, a a challenge of a philosophy but then not long after that uh griff had a um an event with uh the black dot big up to black dot and um he invited me out to the event i was like cool i wasn't really sure why he invited me out but at that event Griff made a public apology to me about, you know, um, you know the, the way that he responded to another. And, and, and I told Griff that, you know, that was dope. He could have done that privately, but it was dope for him to do that publicly because mm -hmm. I think as black men, we need to do that more. When we, when we fuck up, we didn't say, you know what, I fucked up. My bad, I had the wrong information, whatever, whatever. So, you know, um, but when you when you step into this, this realm, particularly as an adult, particularly as someone 
who is capable of, of making their own decisions. Listen, dude, Nick knew what he was doing. I'm glad it happened. See, that part I don't agree with, though. I don't think Nick nah. knew what he was doing. He well, is an well, adult. Think. He had to be responsible. I agree with that. But that's no. my point. He didn't no. know politically what he was doing, and no, he didn't no. know the history well enough to, to no, be no, engaged no. in that way either. I, I mean, I mean, Nick knew what he was doing having Griff on his show. That's what I mean. Well, you know, so I don't even know that. Like, I feel like he... I feel like he wasn't. Well then, well, then you know what? That's his fault, and it's the That's true. fault for not doing it. God Fair damn enough. Universe, Fair enough. And knowing what it is, and so what? I'm glad it happened, and yeah. I'm always happy when those things happen in the mainstream because what it does is it makes the people that want to front on our struggle and our liberation mm. take that shit a bit more serious. This is not a game. This is not something for your rating. This is our lives, and for those of us that are parents and are grandparents, this is not. I tell people I don't run around playing hip hop. This shit is not a game for me. I believe in everything that I teach, and I live the way that I teach. And I don't expect anyone to have to pat me on the back to do that. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a superhero to my children and to my grandchildren. And that's all I need. I don't, I don't really need the outside stuff. You know? um, and yet, I'm open to work with anyone because I do believe I bring a unique set of skills and a, 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 a expertise and experience and education that, that, that can be used to, again, help the, the whole, particularly black people. And as I said, when it's black Africans, it helps the whole world. So I don't see any kind of conflicts in that. But a number of times where we are right now, it, it is, again, a growing period. And my biggest challenge for those, particularly those that are on this line, if you're 40 and older, then it's time for you to either decide there's like three different lanes. You could just stay out of it and have nothing to do with it. You could be an a old nigga just criticizing <laughs> or you could be an elder and begin to have some leadership and, and not try to beat our youth down for not knowing what we didn't teach. You know what I'm saying? And, and to me, that's where hip hop can be extremely important, particularly through rap music, because you don't have to beat your children down. You can put on a rap song when you were their age and tell them your experiences and, and, and how that song impacted you, how those images impacted you. Real life, that's the rap is something you do, hip hop is something you live mindset. You know, and a number of times, I think that, in my opinion, again, it's the it's the forty and older that have bought into the corporations. Like when you look at, you know, the uh, everything that's happening in mainstream uh, rap music, media wise, and everything. I guarantee you, the people that are the, the ones that are making the, the upfront decisions of the day to day, not the big bosses, but the day to day decisions, are between forty and sixty years old for the most part. So they understand yeah. what it is, but they've also made a choice that they're going to side with the corporation. And, right. and I think uh, for those of us that, you know, I, in fact, in Nation Times Syndicate, I wrote an article uh, in, in, our, in our newsletter in 1995. I keep telling people I need to go through my archives and find it. It was called The Hip Hop Civil War, The Culturalist versus the Capitalist. This was in 1995 because, again, we could see when these big companies started buying up the, the independent labels. And this was before the 1996 of, of FCC laws and things of that nature. So we saw what was happening. So we want the people, again, uh, the corporation has this part, but the culture has this part as well. We can do business with the corporation, but we should never, ever let the corporation think they have control or power over us. And I have a challenge with too many people doing it. Now, that's one thing that I do respect about KRS-1. He's had plenty of opportunities to go uh, more mainstream uh, if, if he chooses to. You know, you know, KRS-1 knows everybody in the industry and can get producers to do whatever. But he stayed true to his ethic of hip hop culture and independence and things of that nature. So uh, he, he just dropped his 23rd album and on, I tell people- And it's know, dope. <laughs> oh, I mean, you know, the, the one thing that I tell people when I started working with KRS one that I was most impressed about is that I said he was 17 years in his career as a superstar, icon, and yet his commitment to his craft and to hip hop culture was unquestioned to me. It's like, for him to still be making music, and that's one of the things with the 40 and old as well. It's like, yeah, you were dope back in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But hip hop is a now step thing. If you ain't dope now, just shut up and play your old videos and play your old song. And I say that to the golden age artists, particularly uh, um, Daddy O, KRS One, Public Enemy. You know, they're still making music now. And they're making it for our generation, that, that 35 and older. They're not making it to get on the pop charts. And now, because we have ways to access music in so many different ways, there's no reason not to support them. You know what I'm saying? But on that same end, yeah. if we are not clear on what we're doing in context to what we want it to be future-wise, then we're going to have the same conversation years from now. As you know, uh, just the other day, we just broke ground for the Universal Hip Hop Museum up in the Bronx, up in uh, Bronx Point. Um, 
So, you know, history is talking about those that document and tell the story. You know what I'm saying? So we have to make sure that our story is told from our perspective, our point of view, so our children can look back and hopefully um, add on to our legacy. And again, with this, this document right here, this Bob Declaration of Peace, we just celebrated the 20 year anniversary. Uh, it is 18 principles. And I tell people for me, you know, I've been working international um, hip hop since 2007, big up to the Trinity International Hip Hop Festival, which we didn't even get a chance to really talk about that as well, because see the, the, the international side of hip hop is, is much full culture-wise, it's not just entertainment. Some people are using it politically, some people use it educationally or culture-wise to uplift themselves. So we have to, you know, the 40 and older, we're in a unique position to look at it from a full point of view that young people may not necessarily be equipped to deal from it, but now there are a group of young people that want to deal with it. Like, you know, again, big up to the uh, Trinity uh, Temple of Hip Hop, which is the only Temple of Hip Hop chapter that I know of that's an actual functional chapter that actually does things um, on a consistent basis. They've been doing an international festival since 2007. And I, I don't know anyone else that's actually even doing an international festival, not a concert, but a festival where you're having lectures and panels and film screenings and things of that nature. So, you know, when, when, I, when I look at the future, what hip hop can be, we're in great hands if we decide that we want it to be a certain kind of way. I don't think that it's for everyone. I think it's like every other culture. You know, as I tell people, um, some people love reggae music, love Bob Marley and things of that nature, and yet they have no idea about Rastafarian culture because that's the responsibility of the Rastafarians. I feel the same way about hip hop. If you're not self-identified as being a part of hip hop culture, hip hop community, hip hop nation, whatever you want to call it, if you're not self-identified as being that, I'm not expecting you to do anything but be a consumer of our elements and our product. But on that same minute, if you say I am hip hop and I'm down with hip hop, it's not unreasonable that I'm holding you accountable to these principles and you can hold me accountable. My name is Server. I want to be held accountable. I'm here to serve. Right on. Hey, before we continue on, uh, I, I am seeing some some motion in the chat and there is some, as Craig says, some breaking news uh, uh, that we can we can uh, break here uh, right now that apparently was uh, announced. Well, apparently yesterday. So I don't know yeah, how breaking it is. Yeah. But uh, Patrice Cullors to step down from the, from the BLM Movement Foundation, uh, a co-founder of Black Lives Matter um, announced Thursday that she is stepping down as executive director of the movement's foundation. She decried what she called a smear campaign from a far right group, but said that neither uh, that neither that nor recent criticism from other black organizers influenced her departure. Um, sure, anyway, so sure, sure. she got them houses. She's like, I'm good. Y'all do what y'all want to do with that. I'm straight. I got these houses, got this money, got this notoriety. Y'all do what y'all going to do. And again, that's another example of people not taking seriously the struggle of black liberation. And, and and we as black people, in my opinion, we don't hold them accountable enough because sometimes we don't want to be called haters and things like that. And that's what happened in the 90s to me. It's like you got a lot of grown people co-signing on a bunch of bullshit because they didn't want to be called haters. Well, that was my that was my only that's really I think my only off the top of my head, that's my only complaint about KRS's career, by the way, which I know you are not him and this is not you. You're not his spokesperson, but just as we were talking about it is that in the 90s for me it was puffy that led the charge of of putting up hating as a, a defense against critique mm -hmm. uh he sort of popularized that in, in, in my you know estimation and it, and it was that one time that krs did that track with him that i was like damn it <laughs> like this is the one guy i don't want you messing with because i see you as the antithesis to him but anyway, uh, uh, yeah, and, and you know what? You know, yeah. just to speak with that, that's what he did the, the remix to uh, Step, Step Into a World, world. right? Yeah. And, and again, culture wise, people were pissed about that for sure. <laughs> and and uh, you know, but again, you know, KRS One's explanation yeah. of that is because you know, him and him and Diddy go back to when Diddy was an intern from Uptown, right? You know, so they, they go way back. So again, we have these personal relationships that tie with the business relationship. And you know, KRS One's gonna do what he wants to do. He don't really right. care anyway. I said he's been a nut from the door, you know, um, <laughs> blessed and brilliant at the same time, and just yeah. crazy want to be. But I tell people, in all seriousness, um, what I appreciate about KRS One, uh, my experience with him anyway, is that he did what he didn't have to do. Um, he said that you know, Spirit led him, you know, to to uh, hire me to work with him and things of that nature, and that was something that you know. He could have had anybody in the world doing what I did, but because he said spirit led him to do it, he chose me. And then even like when I started working with KRS, well, just very quickly, 
when, when I started working with cameras, but I was there for the Temple of Hip Hop. Now he didn't know about me being MC Dave T and you know on the radio and all that down in Atlanta and uh, as a DJ and all. He didn't know none of that. And, and, and when we started working together, I never forget we were in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It was a huge festival. Um, for, for those that know me, they know I'm a huge, you know, BDP, uh, X Clan folk. You know, I, I, that's I, I love what we call edutainment, hip hop. That's where I live. I love that type of rap. Um, so we went to the show. We, we, we get there, KRS like, yo, server, grab a mic. I'm like, okay, cool. What you want to talk about the hip hop? He was like, now be my side man. You know, just kind of run, you know, side man with me. And I'm like, okay, cool. And I'm like, you know, cool. I know BDP's catalog front and back, KRS front and back. So we want to stage and, and at rock, and it's like 2,500 people out there. And I'm looking at the back screen, and I'm seeing me and KRS. So I'm having a fucking surreal moment, like, yo, I'm actually on stage rapping with KRS One. Like, well, so we rock the show. So we get back in the limo, and Chris has this big Kool Aid uh, smile, like, yo, server, I didn't, I didn't know you was a yo. You may be more of an MC than you are a minister. I was like, well, you know, it's a thin line between a minister and an MC. The deacon's a hype man. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a thin line between all that. So after that, I ended up being his sideman. We did an 18 city tour, and and I was a sideman. Mind, I'm 39 years old. Karis one is 38, and we went around because we did an 18 city tour throughout the the, the the country and just ripped shit down. So that's when people got a chance to know me. Because after the shows, not only would I, would I rock the mic, but after the shows, I would talk about the Timber Hip Hop, the politics, all that, as Karen Wrestle's going back to the hotel doing whatever. So uh, when he dropped the Keep Right album in 2004 and actually had me on the album, you know, again, man, Chris didn't have to do that. He did that just out of love. And hey, congratulations. He hey, even my, 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 when, when, shout out to Head Rock, shout out to Cornell West Theory, because those two groups have put me on wax. And and not rhyming, don't worry. But 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 I, it's an honor. I was honored by that. I was like that. Yeah. Is, so I can only imagine getting on a KRS. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. And so I yeah. ended up being on, on five songs on that album, and uh, I have one song, that's a spoken word piece. It's like a minute and three seconds it's called Dream. And I tell people when you hear that, that's my whole philosophy in a minute and three seconds. You know what I'm saying? Because you know, as I said this ain't complex. My whole thing is right, to keep it right. mad simple. Brother Malcolm talked about you know uh, b- being able to take something that's complex and explain it to a five year old, and that's that's the oh, mindset. Man, you know what? That I go about teaching and like like don't go over people that people don't care about what you know and all that until they know that you care. First of all, you- I'm sorry to interrupt, but but I want to make you just made a point that people will see discussed in greater detail tonight at seven o'clock on the last dope intellectual. So I want to yeah. that point about breaking something down to yeah. to we have a, a, a Dr. Layla Brown, CBS, and I have a little not debate, but 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 some differences in how we can. It, it, Oh, anyway, that topic is brought up. People should tune back in later on tonight. Man, pick up the Dr. CBS and Dr. Lane. I mean, yeah, no doubt. The whole Black hey. Power Media team, the Luke Mons, and you know, just all the people that are on. That'll it. be on at five thirty. You all and will man, be on at nine o'clock. And man, definitely appreciate what you're doing with this Black Power Media. And and again, man, we're, we're literally at the beginning. You know, what I'm saying yeah, there's no so many different You know, there's a. You know, I, I was I was doing a podcast before I became a uh, social producer for, for Renegade Culture. I was doing a podcast as well. I, I put it on, on, on hiatus for a couple of different reasons, but uh, part of the reason uh, that Kalanj and I, like I said, Kalanj and I have been working together since about 2006, 2007. Um, um, I'm the uh, un- unofficial minister of FTP as well. Um, as well, So, you know, there's a number of, of different things that we, we want to do to bring the culture together, and the arts and the elements are a huge part of that. So let me just I, I, let me. I gotta read this this this. Uh, I want to read this quote before I lose yeah. this comment before I lose it because Patrice was brought up and and uh, it's being said here that that I should interview Patrice uh, in an interview with Mark Lamont Hill. She says she is learning but doing per- things perfectly and and wants to be held accountable. A couple things to to one go back to the um, last dope intellectual from. Was it last week or the week before where we actually talk about the Mark Lamont Hill Patrice interview uh, and all the things that I think they both did wrong in that? For instance, as Patrice mentions in that 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 statement we just showed, she falsely sets up the criticism is coming from the white right when really the real criticism is coming from the black left. Um, But also, I have reached out to Patrice on a number of occasions and, and not only more recently, going back just a couple weeks ago. 
uh, and maybe even like a week ago uh, or two, but going years back, inviting her, Opal, Alicia, to engage the black left. And anybody, please correct me if I'm wrong. I am unaware of any of them ever engaging a black left media outlet. So um, it is not because I have not tried. It is because I don't think they will do it. And and then and not just with me. I don't think it's it, it's not personal. Um, although it may be, I don't know. But but I have never seen them go anywhere black and left of the Democratic Party for a discussion and certainly for a critical in, in, in engagement in investigation of their work. So again, like with Patrice and many others, I reach out to basically everybody, uh, particularly those with whom I disagree who are within this sort of struggle, mm -hmm. not everybody's willing to come on either with me or with others politically, sim similarly politically situated. So, but the other thing I just, that, that is similarly new news that in another direction, I think kind of deals with what we're all talking about here. And this question of someone in the chat mentioned, uh, uh, I think made a reference to this, this previous exchange with me and Killer Mike about him being mentored. Maybe he didn't listen to me, but it looks like maybe he's he's accepting some some mentorship from no name and maybe indirectly Black Alliance for Peace by by doing something. I'm a little bit shocked to see. Run the jewels, Quest, and I'm shocked Quest Love is yeah. involved with this. Now I'm more shocked at Quest Love than Run the Jewels because one thing you know I've known Mike for a while. You know, down here in Atlanta, I've known Mike for a while. We have worked together for over over a decade. And one thing that, that I appreciate about Mike uh, is that he is open to learning. He has learned a lot. And um, uh, the whole part about you being his uh, mentor was just hilarious. I mean, let me just say yeah, that. That was funny. That shit was hilarious. But he is learning. He is listening. He's watching and things of that nature. So sometimes I know on the celebrity side, you know, egos are huge. And they don't always want to give credit where credit is due. But as I said, um, if we're looking for the action, then we don't necessarily need the credit. And I, I, I most certainly believe that you played a huge part in him just becoming aware of the larger view. Because sometimes we can only see things from a certain perspective. And we need that other perspective. Whether we agree or disagree, you know, I, I like to have a different perspective. So then you can make your own decisions and you're not getting caught up in groupthink all the time. You yeah, know, no, so I, do, I, I, I don't think, I agree with you about not needing, well, I often like, I do want, I, 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 well, I often joke that I do want the credit, but in this case, in most cases <laughs> like this, I don't, I don't want, and I don't think I deserve any, but I don't think, I think if anything, he's probably had more engagement uh, offline with, with no name, or maybe he just looked at some black Alliance for peace newsletters and just, I don't know. I don't know. I'm actually shocked by that, but to your point, I'm even more shocked by quest loves involvement. Yeah. Oh, sure. uh, uh, by the way, Andrea, uh, Roland Martin, is, this is my point. Roland Martin is not left of the Democratic Party. He's a well-funded corporate uh, 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 defender of the Democratic Party. So what I'm talking about specifically, and that's my point, it's not black media, it's black left, black which left. which is, so especially- black radical I, left, I would say. You know, well, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and to your point- a radical perspective and you're dealing with black people, then you're fronting. I'm gonna say that directly. We have no time for you to be front. This is not murdering our children. This is not just about trying to position yourself for your next contract. And as I tell people, I live in Atlanta. It's not an accident that I'm not on the sexy, glamorous, popular entertainment side of Atlanta. I made a conscious choice to be on this side, but I'm not saying everybody should have to make my choice. I'm saying those that have chosen to be about the people, be about the people. Hey, this is an interesting question from 235 Worldwide from Minister Server. Does the phrase shout out have origins in hip hop? That's deep. That's interesting. Um, no, I, I, I wouldn't say hip hop. I would say you know, Cal Calloway was giving shout outs and you know, saying stuff like that. Mm. I, I mean, I, I, but the phrase was he using that phrase? Well, well I, I, I'm not. I, I was going to say I don't know if he's actually using that phrase. I know we kind of popularized the whole shout out thing for sure. And it's funny because I hear people on uh, NPR and stuff like that say, "I want to give a shout out to this, that, the other." Um, we, we definitely popularized it if we didn't start. I, I don't really know whether we started, but we most certainly popularized it. Hey, check this out. Here's a, here's, here's another one. And we can start to wrap. I know I'm holding you up here, but this, oh, no, is, this is actually good, pretty... Hey, listen, so, man. Listen, yeah. Jerry. In all seriousness, I appreciate your consistency. Because what I tell people, um, no matter what, whatever way you feel about me, one, one of the cornerstones about me is my consistency. I, I appreciate people that are consistent. We grow, we learn, but we're consistent in our core values. And I really appreciate 
you uh, particularly because you've done a lot of work. I, I know you don't flash your resume all the time, uh, but you've done mad work. And uh, a lot of us that may not know you directly are most certainly benefiting from your scholarship, from your expertise, from your point of view. So enough respect to you. Um, I got time, yo. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I appreciate all of that. Uh, uh, it, it, a couple of a, a couple of weeks ago, somebody on YouTube, of course, anonymously was saying more or less that um, somehow I forgot exactly the point of the origins, but the point was for this com person commenting was that I or we here weren't doing enough to um, acknowledge the black radical media producers that were saying something about that we were saying wasn't being said, something like that. And I asked them, I said, so please list who you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Like, who's the black left? Because I keep thinking if they're black and left, I, I know it's silly, but I keep thinking I would have at least heard of them. I would have found them. I will oh, find their yeah. work. I will, you know, at this point. So I was like, who are they? And it was funny because to, to Blood Honey's comment here, every single person that this commenter ended up listing was already on BPM. So I was like, I was like, you're not even paying attention to your own channel because they were like hating on the channel. But they were like, well, you got CBS, you got Black Miss podcast, you got uh, uh, Renegade Culture, you got you. you know." And I'm like, everybody's already involved. So I was like, not one of the people they listed was not already involved. Um, uh, Hood Communist has been invited, I think. Uh, um, well, they can speak for themselves as to why that hasn't happened. But uh, uh, um, uh, outside of that one time we had to preempt a, an, an interview with them for expressed, already explained political reasons, uh, they've been invited to have a show on this platform or to, to propose a show for this platform. Uh, but my point is, but, but in terms of, of, of multimedia production, uh, to my knowledge, Hood Communist is, is largely print at this point. But to my point, in terms of what this commenter was initially saying in the YouTube, was that you got to go find all these other black left podcasts and all this other stuff. And I was like, where are they? And everybody they listed was already in the mix. So I was like, wow, that's deep. Uh, exactly. uh, yeah. Anyway. We're definitely, we're definitely doing something unique and special here uh, with, with Black Power Media. And um, I think it's definitely needed, man. You know, appreciate, you know, uh, just being a part of it. Uh, definitely. Uh, looking to have a show, you know, coming soon. Uh, we've been kind of talking about behind the scenes with Kalanji and uh, and Kamal and I. Absolutely. Um, again, you know, bringing back my podcast. I, I was doing a podcast called Hip Hop Bridge Builders, and it's really for conversations like this because, as I said, the, the bridge goes both ways. So uh, we have a lot to uh, teach our youth. We have a lot to learn from them as well. So the Hip Hop Bridge Builders podcast. I'm definitely looking forward to uh, bring it as another podcast we're going to be doing called Transmitting Live from the Planet Earth, which is one of my uh, titles that I, I use when I do my intro and uh, talking to some of these uh, people, you know, to tell some of those stories. And it's really not so much um, to get the popular views, but when, as I tell people, you know, all of us, you know, one of the concepts for the Temple of Hip Hop is um, a mass movement, ministry, archive, school, society. And I, I, I love that concept because each of us in our own selves, our ministry, we are an archive, we are a school, a society within ourselves. So as I tell people, you know, all the work that I'm doing, I'm not really sure how world history is going to record the work that I'm doing, but I know that my children and my children's children will have enough um, documentation that they can see what uh, Baba Server has done. Right on. Uh, and that's all it really comes down for me. If the if the world acknowledges me, cool, but I'm more concerned about my family and I'm adding on to the legacy. Um, I was able to break some what we call um, generational cycles. Like I wasn't raised by my father and I take pride in raising all six of my children, particularly my three sons and my son, Dave. Let me give a shout out to Super Dave, who is most certainly just taking it to a whole nother level. At 35, he's where I was. In, I don't know if I was at that place at 50. So he's definitely taking it to the next level. But at the end of the day, for me, and, and I don't shy away from that, this is personal. This is about my family and my community and things of that nature to add on. So any way that I can serve, any way that I can align with to do that, as long as you're in alignment with something that's going to be progressive, positive, project, you know, uh, projecting something that we want to be, I'm down. Other than that, I'm not really down. And I don't have a problem in not being included in, particularly in Atlanta. You know, Atlanta has a lot of hype stuff that I get invited to. I'd be like, I'm not gonna do nothing but come there and get on y'all nerves. That's, that's only that's gonna happen. That's like they go serve on that shit again because I'm on that shit. So yeah. So you know, again, 
you know, big up to those that can walk this path. It's not for everyone. I believe that everyone has a divine calling. When you connect with whomever you call your creator and whoever you believe to be your ancestor, I believe your divine calling will be revealed to you. And when you fulfill that, then you've done what you're here to do. Well, Minister Server, I appreciate you. And anytime you you need some space to rock on beyond with the with the with the fellas confine you to a renegade culture, you got a spot right here, man. We definitely have to do this again. I think this has been great. I really appreciate, appreciate you, man. Appreciate you, bro. And again, man, looking forward to the continued build, man. Keep shining, bro. Yes, indeed. You too, sir. I appreciate you. All right, man. Take good care. We'll see you tonight on Renegade Culture, my man. Take yes, it sir. easy. Sir, Renegade right. Culture. Bo, 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 bo. <laughs> All right, everybody, man. Big, big shout out and thanks to Minister Server. Big shout out and thanks to my man Kaba. Really appreciate that, and uh, 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 I'm happy to have uh, uh, been able to do that this morning with them. Um, I saw a couple things in the chat that I honestly wanted to respond to when when Minister Server wasn't here because I didn't want to drag him down into some of uh, what is potentially my own. Um, uh, I don't know. I feel like I didn't want to uh, sully the, the 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 dear good brother with a, with a couple of things here um, uh, that I did want to quickly respond to before we, before we bounce up out of here. Uh, one of them was somewhere, 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 somewhere. Um, well, one uh, um, uh, bar. You know, you know, frankly, and I, and, and, and I, I, I don't ever want to uh, confuse anything, you know, with the person on the political. Um, Black Agenda Report has been and continues to be an essential outlet. I was once a part of helping build or support its build. I was, I don't want to overdo it. I was one of the helping support Glenn and Bruce uh, uh, at at its inception. Uh. uh but um, I don't, you know, one of the reasons I don't think that they're officially involved with, with us here is I just think so, you know, a, a falling out between me and Glenn some years ago. I, honestly, I just think that's what that is. Um, and they're off course doing their own platforms. Oh, and then belatedly me and Danny Haifong, I guess, had a little falling out on the side, too. So I guess that would be one of the issues. Uh, but certainly we've interviewed Margaret Kimberly on this platform many times. Uh, and my own daughter, my youngest daughter interviewed her, uh, in fact, uh, for her new book. So it's nothing, and it's certainly not to suggest that that Barr doesn't deserve, uh, although I do disagree with the piece they published on Afro-pessimism and a couple other things, but, you know, whatever. They're certainly a valuable outlet. Uh, I, I don't know if I agree with this one. I don't know if I agree with this one, and I don't think, um, I don't think at this point you can argue that Dr. Carr has left. Uh, I, I don't think um, I might be more in line with this comment here, uh, or not this one. Uh, there was someone else who. Um, oh, I don't know. But but uh, uh, I thought I saw someone else. Yeah, I don't. I don't agree that they're fire. Uh, I don't agree that they're left either. But um, yeah, yeah, this is the one I was looking at. Uh, yeah, I don't know about that. I don't think that they're left. And uh, um, and I will continue to say the last time Carr was on Karen Hunter talking about my book in my absence, he completely got wrong and misrepresented my argument. And when I reached out to him and Karen about that, they never responded. So, you know, I don't I don't really I don't think they're left. Uh, I mean, I've, you know, Kim Brown, obviously, and we reached out and she's, you know, at least in part working with us on the remix. Um so I don't feel like we've missed too many, at least in terms of trying to reach out and build. Uh, um, uh, okay, all right, all right. Um, anyway, yeah, definitely rest in peace, Bruce Dixon, man. Even when we disagreed, man, that brother was a good, he was a good brother, man. I, I just, I, I, again, we never agreed on, on everything, but... Yeah, uh... Yeah, he's all over the place and in no place. Uh, he, he, you know, um, I don't think that's on me. I think that's on him. I don't think that's on me. I think that's on him. He knows my number. He knows it very well. In fact, he texted me more recently uh, asking about something else that, that you know, uh, what at the time wasn't worthy of a response. But so he knows how to reach me and he knows exactly everybody. I mean, again, we've known each other for years. That's what I'm saying. 
That's what I'm saying. That's what I was saying earlier. Again, I, I don't have everything right. I don't even pretend to understand everything. I just feel like I have earned the right to get some responses and some levels of respect from people, you know, some, from some of these certain uh, specific folks. And I've let them all know. You know, so Carr knows exactly what I think and he knows exactly how to reach me, as does everybody else in that email from last night. They know exactly. and They've all been reached out to and can holler at me whenever they want. So uh, my point is, I am trying to build. Have always been trying to build. So I won't, you know, I'm happy to, you know, I, I stand up for, I, you know, I get more criticism around here than I think I deserve, frankly, from some folks who don't, haven't earned the right to do so and don't know always what they're talking about. But I'm open to being criticized and certainly don't, you know, but, but uh, uh, I'm trying to build and, and I don't know that in all cases that's, that, that sentiment is the same or maybe just me. So as long as they do the, the work elsewhere, that's fine. It, it, they don't have to do it with me. It's all good. Uh, can you talk more in depth about the real news ownership and culture? Sure. Uh, I'd be happy to. Uh, now, I left in about 2016, 2017, 20. Anyway, it's been some years since I've been there. And literally, uh, I have not clicked on that website once. So I don't know exactly what they're doing or who's there. Uh, and um, uh, But the Real News Network, when I was there, was was run by Paul J. Um, and his uh, Sri Lankan partner, Char Charmini, which, and again, I always thought it was funny. I said this to them both in their, in their person. She did her master's thesis on Fanon, and Paul Jay had admitted in front of her and me that he never read Fanon. And I was like, how can this be your, your, your partner, uh, and how can you pretend to be involved in a political struggle uh, of any kind and not read Fanon? That's just not acceptable. I was like, you, you, I don't care, white, black, whatever. If you're going to be part of a radical struggle, and I don't care if you even agree with him, Fanon is unescapable, inescapable, unavoidable, too big to fail. <laughs> but I thought, but I, I bring that story up because I think it was emblematic of the whole thing. I, I, um, uh, and there's actually a much longer story. My time with, with, with the real news is really about a fake sabbatical that was meant to, uh, uh, um, you know, as long as possible, get me out of the school of journalism at Morgan, where where there were where other issues politically, uh, and because I had brokered a relationship with with Morgan and the Real News prior to to any you know uh, because I'd known Paul for some years, uh, uh, we just worked out for me to take the sabbatical there. But I had already told Paul I did not want to work with the Real News because I had already told Paul that I thought that he was a condescending, stereotypical uh, white progressive who was, you, you know, and so I actually said, so, so work. So, and I said, I, actually, we met years before he even put the real news together and he was inviting me. And I said, um, I said, nah, I, I was like, no, nah, that this is not my lane. That's not my lane. I did meet with him. I thought he had a good plan. I thought he was clear. I think he's intelligent. I think he can lay out even it for himself, a, a, an analysis. I think, you know, and, and, we're, and I, as I always said about the real news at the time, I appreciated uh, the clarity of his plan for his work, but it wasn't mine. So I even put him in touch with other um, uh, black activists and, and so-called leaders with whom I thought he would have and was correct that would have more in line politically and said, hopefully you all can do some good work, but it's not for me. Years later, as a result of this issue with with with, with my former school, I uh, uh, took this so-called sabbatical, which is not really a sabbatical, considering I produced hundreds. You know, sabbatical is supposed to be a break for you to think about your other stuff. I didn't do a whole bunch of work, worked through the summer, did a whole bunch of stuff. It was great. Got to build with Bashi Rose, do the George Jackson joint. It was just, it was fake, it, 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 fake sabbatical. I'm reading the text I just got. Um, uh, uh, fake sabbatical is what i'm trying to say that it was it was labeled a sabbatical but a sabbatical is generally you know understood to be you go off and do work and rejuvenate and this that and, you know your own research or your own kind of but i ended up doing more work more more you know anyway but the point is what i learned from the very beginning because uh, I was sat down by a guy, I forgot his, his actual full name, but it, it, he was always referred to as TM, this rich white guy in California who inherited a bunch of money, who uh, uh, told me in, in our meeting that he, he, the Real News 
re really launched because he saw Paul J do a video and he sent them a thousand dollars and then said, I want to help you build. So as I always would argue with Paul, I was like, dad, this is, this is funny because you talk about your genius and whatever and your, your, your brilliance and I acknowledge you have a good plan for yourself or whatever, but the only real difference between what you've done with the real news and what everybody else is out here trying to do is that a rich white man saw you and funded you and gave you a bunch of money and created the Real News Network, bought the building that they now have in, in, in downtown Baltimore, funded, and at the time, I believe, uh, when I was there, it was said that he was funding more than 70% of the whole operation uh, salaries and all that. So it wasn't subscriptions. It wasn't that Paul had built this huge, you know, whatever, uh, 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 this powerhouse that everybody was supporting all the money that was floating around was coming from this one guy. I also heard off the, uh, uh, by the way, yesterday, I have to double check that he's selling the building. Now in that meeting, TM told me, and this is in 2015, already he said, the purchase of the building and the little bit of he did to put stuff in it with the real news, because at the time it wasn't even finished, uh, would make him 10 million in, in a sale. So he was like, I'm good profit wise. I'm good. Whether the re real news su is successful or not. Uh, I'm just trying to do this for the good, whatever. So I, it's interesting that he's he's uh, and people, you know, were were let go as he cut his funding at the end of 2020 during the pandemic uh for whatever reasons and uh so some folks is real news were let go or you know redistributed or whatever um there's a lot more there's a lot of there, there I, i'm going too much into this but there's a couple uh, points that i would want to quickly highlight that i think are indicative here one um well, i already mentioned the thing with Fernand. there's so many other stories that could be told but one was that i i remember in, in doing an interview uh, there's a lot of little things like I would, anyway, I was doing, I did this interview, uh, cause I had already told Paul, I'm going to have, I have to have a certain level of autonomy for this to work. Like I'm not just one of these regular folks you got working in here. I'm coming into this situation very differently, you know, and we had worked out this whole thing that I thought, you know, it turned out not to be the case, but the, 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 I did this interview with Paul Street, this white guy who was a uh, 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 left of the democratic party, who was at the time critical of Bernie Sanders for not being genuinely left and because a lot of the time was we got to support bernie we got to support bernie da, 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 da. we do this interview and immediately afterwards i get you know paul tells me that tm told him no more discussions uh criticisms of bernie sanders that's it so already this 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 white maleness was in in, in an alternative media space was was directly telling me that what I was doing was even interviewing a white guy. Because initially, I, I do remember, Paul and I had this conversation. I said, Paul, you sure this is going to work for you? Because when I come in and do what I'm doing, it's very different than what you and your other folks at The Real News are doing. And your donor base might get upset. He, and then his initial thing was, oh, well, then let him get upset. We got to upset him then. I said, okay. Uh, so never mind the black folks I tried to bring in there. This Just this white leftist uh caused this level of trouble now the real blow up was when i did an interview with daruba shortly after angela davis had appeared on a, a democracy now to talk about asada shakur daruba comes on with me at the real news to talk about both angela davis amy goodman and he even added alice walker as being inappropriate spokespeople for Asada Shakur, specifically around Angela Davis saying at the time that Asada was innocent. And Daruba's point, and this is what, what caused all, of, all the trouble, Daruba's point was, don't you dare call her innocent. You weren't training with her. You weren't in the Black Panther Party. You weren't in the car that turned Pike in, 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 in that day. And when you say that she's innocent, you take away her agency and the clarity of her politics that put her in that car, that put her through the training, that made her conscious of why she was doing what she was doing and why what happened subsequent to that did take place, which he reminded Angela and Amy and Alice had nothing to do with. And in fact, he made the point, he said, he said in that interview, don't say she was innocent when I trained her to shoot and she was a better shot than me, he said. My immediately after in fact, the, the, it never aired. Paul 
cut the piece and I and I that that's what really killed our relationship because I said how dare you not only <laughs> censor me but how dare you censor Daruba and then to couch it in some sort of uh, uh, balance of journalism I said if you disagree with what is aired on my segment create another segment that criticizes it. You have a whole network here. You have plenty of other people. You even have another former political prisoner in Eddie Conway, other people who are here who could who are perfectly situated if there's a disagreement to do their own segment in, in, in disagreeing, but don't censor. Um, and that, the last one actually involved the George Jackson piece where he dis he 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 dis he disrespected George Jackson and we had words over that as well. So uh anyway, my, my point is is that the that and, and I did uh I was asked um, more recently to write a, a statement about my experiences at the Real News when Paul Jay was being removed. Um and apparently that upset the TM money guy even more because I, I said that it it was the typical or stereotypical white liberal paternalistic condescending environment that uh um the the he literally had at one point all of the black people there were in the cultural group and all of the straight news was done by uh whites and everybody else uh i raised that as an issue um he talked the way he talked to people I wrote, I remember I wrote Paul and Charmini an email after a meeting where he went in on somebody. And I told, I was like, if you, I was like, I can't imagine anybody letting somebody talk to them like that. You are saying, claiming to offer an alternative. How dare you treat these people like that? And the person I'm talking about was a white person at that. It's like, how dare you talk to the people you work with like that? What kind of operation are you trying to run here? So, uh, the last point is, is that I was told by, um, I don't know where he is now in relation, but somebody who was at, at the time sort of running the place that TM said, Jared can't come back. Cause initially the person said, would you come back now that Paul's going to be gone? And I was like, probably not. But I also said, I don't think TM would let me back. And then he confirmed that was the case. So I've been said by name not to be invited back by the guy, the main funder, apparently at least allegedly, at least I heard that secondhand, but. Uh, so that's why, like on the remix yesterday, I don't mind saying this, you know, when, when Kim Brown brings up, uh, uh, you know, wants to, uh, uh, shout out her sister, her, her colleague, uh, that's one thing, but when you do it in conjunction with praising the real news network and the breakfast brew, the, the you know, the morning brew, or whatever, the Baltimore brew, I'm not letting, I, I, you know, I can't. I, I refuse to let that go by. Those outlets are not here to help. They're not. They're, they, they're hugely problematic. Uh, so, so that was my point. I don't. You know, Lisa, the reporter, she talked about as a, as a separate, uh, you know, discussion. But uh, the 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 outlets can't. I, I was not a, a, you know, comfortable letting just be praised on an outlet that we're creating here to be, you know, uh, an actual alternative. So. Uh, anyway, that's 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 there's so much more on it that that could be said, but um, woo, it was it was a it was a now I, the flip side is I learned a lot. I will say this: I learned a lot. Now you know, for instance, I, I initially I told Paul that I wanted to go to all the executive morning meetings because I thought at first I thought they were fantastic because the 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 the, the fantasy was everybody gathering around a big table in the morning discussing and debating the news and the perspectives and what would, but what, it, but I told him, I said, it very qu quickly devolved into these morning meetings of just you telling everybody what news to cover and how to cover it. I was like, this is, this is, this is real corporate. This seems real commercial. Uh, so as soon as I could leave, I left and, uh, uh, but I, I did learn a lot. I got to work with some great people, particularly like Bashi Rose. We got to produce that, that George Jackson video mixtape. While there, uh, which which I remain very proud of, uh, which was not welcomed either, by the way, uh, uh, we you know I got to meet a, a number of of uh, uh, young people who are who you know I get why pe people will often say they 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 feel hope because uh, they you know these really intelligent young folks uh, um, uh, and particularly on issues not involving black or or African you know histories were way more informed. Than I was. So that's another reason why I initially wanted to be in those meetings, because I was like, damn, they know all this stuff about, you know, whatever. 
uh, that I didn't know. So I was like, this would be great. But but it just devolved into some, oh man, it was just whack and really just dis- like more disappointing than I would have even expected. Uh, so anyway, to the extent that others find value in, in the real news or other, I, I, that's fine. I, you know, I, I don't mind, you know, at, at this point it is for me, it is, you know, my own personal boycott uh, of that outlet. But, uh, um, you know, anyway, so that was that was that that was that um, I guess in a nutshell. Uh, but. Um, yeah, it was it was wild, man, and it was a wild conversation at first meeting with TM, too. He, he, he went out of his way to, you know, I studied ethnomusicology and I know I inherited all this money, but I went and studied, you know, maybe we could build on, you know, vibe on your work in hip hop because I went and studied the, you know, I don't know, the indigenous communities in Central and South America. And I learned this, that and the third. And, uh, you know, so I don't want you to think that I'm just money and, you know, I'm going to, you know, blah, 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 blah. I was like, wow, that's that's deep. Uh, that's really deep. Um, so I, I hear you, but, you know, part of the, the interaction, I, I understand the interaction with Kim Brown could have been, that's fine. I, I don't mind. Well, let me rephrase that. I recognize that in the position I'm playing, I'm going to be open to criticism. The only thing that I have to share that 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 is is a little bit misunderstood about that moment is uh, the 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 production side. You know, we did have to rap, so it wasn't in, just an attempt to cut her off. And then we did bring her back to let Kim finish her point. But uh, um, you know, w- there is a production process that goes on with the morning show. It's not just me doing whatever. So if, if, you know, there are roles that have to be played and there are moments where you got to cut and go to something else because you got other people waiting to do their work. So, um, but, Joe, you know, OK, I mean, you know. Um, OK, I didn't take it out on Kim. She praised the real news, though. She's a grown woman. I don't understand that. I didn't take anything out on her. She praised the real news. I was like, no, fuck the real news. That's all. Uh, I'm misrepresenting what Kim was saying. She mentioned Tyrion. I understand that. But all I was trying to point out, no, I understood that. And I, again, that's why I wasn't saying anything about Lisa. And I was saying praise Lisa without mentioning her place of employment or without mentioning that her place of employment is inhibiting the, the good work she probably could be even doing more of. And I know the morning brew is, uh, uh, but understand, but right before you switched segments, you made sure to say what you had to say, needed to say, which made it appear she was cut off. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I hope you all are at least acknowledging the correction we made where I held up my own interview to give her more time to wrap up. But we did have to, anyway, okay, that's fine. That's good, that's good. Um, yeah, started the show with the light skin jab then walked over Jared's use of Taibi clip. That part, I mean, you know, I did mean to bring that back today because I think we lost the point I was trying to make uh, about what Taibi was saying. Uh, so, so uh, in fact, you know what, I'm, you know, if, if I'm just gonna do it now because, because, um, I'm going to run that clip again and come back to that point because I don't think we actually got, did get to make the point I wanted to make, but, um, uh, what's wrong with a little back and forth? Yeah, no, I, in general, I agree with this. What I am, I, I admit I am sensitive to this. I don't want to be seen and I don't want to be misrepresented either as, uh engaging in crass patriarchy and just trying to shut sisters down when they're trying to speak so that was the that was the only part i i think back and forth is good i think that that um maybe we either need to prearrange for it so that we're clear that's going to happen or um be more mindful of the production schedule and the production notes from the producer being sent to everybody privately that people are ignoring while on screen and I think we'll, you know, do better. But I think that's that's cool too. That's cool too. Uh, but yeah, I am gonna let me share this because I, I I do think we lost sight of of the point I was trying to make. This is just a short clip of Matt Taibbi on Jimmy Dore, 
and again, they're talking about this in the context of I don't want to get into this part, but but the the new reporting that is 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 seeming to show with with substance that the the COVID virus did come out of the Wuhan labs, um, not necessarily in in the 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 scandalous conspiracy sense, but in the in the way that in but apparently in science, they are intentionally creating vex- viruses to learn how to destroy them. And in the process, one got out. But what 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 the discussion here is saying is that that initially commercial journalism just jumped out there and said, if you bring this up, it's conspiracy and shut it down and this and that when when the journalists themselves don't necessarily know. Now, I actually think and Kim is happy. I'm happy to come back and have this conversation with her. I actually think Kim got defensive around the critique of professional journalism and journalism schools. Uh, but I think what Matt says here about journalism and journalism schools is 100 percent correct. And again, just for context, I got a Ph.D. in journalism and public communication from the University of Maryland at College Park, which at the time in the early 2000s was said to have been a top three to five journalism school program. I've said many times, I think getting the PhD in that top program was uh, light work compared to just the two years of the master's program at the Africana Studies of Research Center uh, that happens to be at Cornell University or was brought on, at, uh, imposed by African revolutionaries at Cornell. But, but at the same time, I have experience with a journalism school and I taught in one. I watched one get e- developed around me when I was initially in a communications department which is different than a journalism school. Maybe we can come back and talk about that. But I watched a journalism school evolve around me uh, over the last seven or eight, 10 years at Morgan State. Uh, And I've seen how that has evolved and how that has been uh, run. Uh, And anyway, so I have at least some experience with, 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 with journalism school. So I think what he says, and I think what he says here is at minimum, of great value. So I just want to play, it's, it's not even, I think, two minutes long, but or maybe two and a half minutes, but something like that. About journalism. It, yeah, this is a, this is a classic screw up uh, of journalism because COVID is, is, it's the kind of story that, that uh, sort of reveals the, the core truth about the journalism business, which is that we basically don't know anything. Like we're, we're not experts. You know, at best, a lot of us went to journalism school and what, we, what did we study? Journalism, which isn't anything. So when we get presented with a story like this, which is highly technical uh, and extremely complicated in the, in the best circumstance, we're completely dependent upon experts, and we're only telling you our best guess about what could possibly be true. And so the worst thing you can possibly do at the start of a story like this is instantly start ruling things out and declaring some things facts and some things conspiracy theories, uh, and be and on top of that being sanctimonious and obnoxious about it. Uh, you have to have some humility with the job of journalism, I think that's actually crucial to how you do this job is you have to know that you don't know anything and you have to be suspicious of everybody that you talk to. And, and over time, things get revealed and that's how you get to a truth. They did it backwards this, uh, with the story. They declared a truth at the start and now they're in this backpedal mode, where, which is a complete catastrophe for the business and for, for the country. So, again, I think that's exactly right. And now, now uh, I talked about him earlier, you know, one of the things Glenn Ford used to say to me all the time, and I don't know how much he said this publicly, but I think it's a great point. Uh, um, uh, jur- there should be no such thing as a journalism school. Journalism should be taught as a sub- subset within the English departments that people should be learned to read and write properly and then learn the basic core principles of journalism as a subset to uh, an English department. I think that's exactly right. Journalism is not that deep. I think it's more important to learn how to write, maybe learn how to put a story together, learn how to do investigations, do learn how to do research. You don't need a journalism school to do that. And that's the point. Journalism schools were uh, developed originally by the newspaper industry so that the public could pay for training people to work at the newspapers without newspapers having to pay to train their own journalists. 
So they got the state and other financiers to fund journalism schools. And what happens in journalism schools? Now, at the high end, I think I came in at the end of what was like the, the height of, of the fight over uh, intellectualism versus practical uh, journalism production. And there was this argument between uh, uh, um, the, the, the chi squares and the green eye shades was the old version. The chi squares were the intellects and the green eye shades were the journalists, the hardcore journalists who you know worked over the newspaper putting it. And the point was for me at the time was, even before I heard Glenn's perfect summary was, we need to understand history. We need to understand uh, you, you know, uh, certainly radical theories and ideas. I mean, we need to understand ideological, we need to get into these ideological debates, these theory debates. The journalism stuff is easy. What do you need all this journal? Like, you know, and then I thought it was interesting. They had us reading Marx and, and, and radical theorists in communication and media. Uh, I was introduced to stuff that I really like, like, Marshall McLuhan and Harold Ennis and stuff like that. Um, uh, but that de wing, that debate lost. And by the time, for instance, the journalism school was developed at Morgan State, the, the, the dean came in and the first meeting he had with us after telling us those of us with PhDs were, would be useless and targeted uh, and, and marginalized because um, he and, and his journalist friends don't have PhDs and don't find them to be necessary, even at universities. He, the first article he gave us was he want, it, it, the teaching hospital model. And his point was, he said, we're going to develop our journalism school like this on the teaching hospital model. What's the teaching hospital model? Corporations that develop medical technology pay, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, pay hospitals to well, the payment is either direct payment or the free use of of technology and 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 but as long as you teach your doctors what we want them to learn, we will give you this money is essentially the point. So the dean's point was we're going to teach people in this school what the media industry wants them to learn so they can get jobs. So people like Jared and others who are saying, I'm not here to prepare people to work in the media industry. I'm here to create thinkers, critical thinkers, um, maybe emancipatory journalists, maybe, um, look, at, at minimum, just critical thinkers. I'm not here to prepare people. I don't think the job of, of a professor at a university, we're not a trade school, I was arguing. My job isn't to prepare somebody to work at a factory. My job isn't to prepare somebody to work at Fox. My job is to prepare someone who may end up taking a job at Fox to understand the context in which they're entering. That's what I thought my job was and still think my job would be if I worked in that school or was teaching future journalists. So when Taibi, and because my point is, journalists are not trained in these fields. Journalists are not And because of the corporate takeover, they're just they're just reduced to stenographers. That used to be the dismissive point raised uh, at the time I was in the grad program, but that's where we are now. They just become stenographers, and that's why uh, if 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 they are if they are not trying if they're not submitting a story. By the way, on Monday, Dr. Quasi Carnadu is going to come back to talk about the reparations piece that we talked about that he wrote to talk about reparations uh, last week on this show because. He watched that clip and wants to add to the discussion a, a, an element about this editorial process, this journalistic process that he suffered in producing the piece that we used to discuss reparations. So it's like another little parallel here. Be, so that'll be happening on Monday because what happens journalistically, it, one of the things you learn is, is that editors who are uh, well-paid and positioned and work for the bosses and the owners manage the journalists and the final content of the product that you find printed. And oftentimes the journalists whose name is on the byline didn't have the final edit, didn't write the headline, didn't use, wasn't in charge of shaping some of the language that was crafted. That's all done to appease 
the donor base, the ownership, et cetera, the advertisers, et cetera. So uh, um, uh, now I think that that on the show the other day, because um, this is something that happens all the time, people who work in professional journalism or who aspire to work in professional journalism don't respond well to that kind of criticism. Nobody wants to be told that you don't know what you're talking about. Now go do more research. They want to be perceived as at least being capable of becoming the expert. So by the time their name is on the byline that you all read, or we all read, they are seen as offering you an expert analysis, but often that is not what is, 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 is journalism. It's, it's, something else uh um anyway so that was really i just i you know and and, and anyway that point i think got kind of lost uh um uh in part because of my own reaction to to um uh the mere mention of the real news network uh which was really all i was focused on that that uh uh Anyway, just to wrap this up, that the Real News Network wasn't and isn't, I, well, wasn't at the time I was there. I don't know what they're doing now. Maybe there's been some massive sea change. Um, uh, at the time I was there, was not doing anything different than what the teaching hospital model of journalism was encouraging. The only difference was instead of uh, it being an elite corporation that was determining the, 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 the journalism content, it was a singular white man. In fact, the Real News, this was the point I was making at the time, the Real News Network was actually worse than a Fox or an MSNBC or a CNN because it was only one man that was funding and determining the content that was being produced. Even at a corporation, there's at least an editorial, there's a, there's a hierarchy, there's a, there are levels, there's a, there's an admin, there's a, you know, editors, there's, you know, uh, uh, executive editors, uh, producers and directors, et cetera. Here, it was just this one man literally making a phone call saying, kill that piece. Tell Jared he's never doing that again. In fact, tell everybody they're not interviewing anybody critical of Bernie Sanders on the Real News Network. Imagine that. Imagine that. Imagine that. Uh, so, so anyway, that was really my own point. And, uh, um, you know, anyway. Yeah, I did. I did. I did. Uh, <laughs> uh, I find value in this discussion about journalism because the ways in which people who run blogs regardless of content are dismissed as unserious they aren't journalists. that's a really good point too that's a very good point that somehow your blog isn't isn't uh... but look one of the things I've really I, I, I mentioned this in the chat during one of their first editions of this but one of the things that I've always appreciated that that uh, that the Lukemans do with these series of interviews with Milton Alamadi is that his work, I forgot the title of it, but his work, his one of his early works on, on the New York Times in Africa is a book I brought in and referenced regularly in uh, my, my uh, 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 in the PhD program for journalism and within the the, the debates with with liberal uh, professional journalists for years saying don't dismiss me or some other blogger when the New York Times has been exposed I don't know how many decades now since Alamadi published that book for decades and I don't even care about the Judith Miller Iraq scandal and I don't even care about the the, you know, the weapons of mass destruction and all the more recent and ongoing mistakes and er errors of the New York Times, Alamadi already showed you that when it comes to Africa and African people, the New York Times is an imperial outlet bent on destroying the image and the, the, the analyses and struggles of African people. So, uh, and that's, that's you know, the, the establishment, that's, that's your number one joint. And they don't know a damn thing or worse. They do when they're doing it intentionally. So, you know, I thought, I thought that was interesting. Uh, uh, so I, I love that they have all the on as much as they can. I hope they do even more. Um, yeah, I got to find the book again. Let me, I don't, let me just Milton, al Africa and New York times. Let me see if I can get this pulled up real quick. Hearts of darkness. That's it. My bad. 
How could you, actually, I should, that's ridiculous that I would forget that name. Uh, uh, where is, let me get a, uh, uh, a cover. Let me get a, let me get a, this is it right here. Boom, bitty, boom, bang. Uh, when did this joint come out? Let me show you. Uh, man, I used to use, I got to read it again, man. I got to read a lot of stuff again, but I used to use this all the time. The hearts of darkness, how white writers created racist image of Africa. A critique of Western media's tribalization of African news coverage, beginning with the accounts of the European so-called explorers who went to discover Africa in the 18th, 19th centuries and include, including the coverage of Africa by Western newspapers, including the New York Times from the 19th century to contemporary coverage. What's the year on this, though? Why does it, where's the year? 85, 2002. Really? That, I thought it was older than that. But yeah, that would have come out right as I was going into the grad program. Okay, I thought it was older than that. But yeah, that's that's it. That's the joint right there. Uh, that's right. Paul Street wrote some great stuff on Obama. And Dr. Burroughs and I have an interview with Paul Street uh, uh, on I Mix What I Like's chant on, on the you know playlist for I Mix What I Like at Black Power Media. Uh, uh, on on Paul Street had uh, written a really good book on on Obama. A couple of years ago um and he was exactly right about uh bernie sanders by the way too i think uh by the way i did hear at the time the real news did not have a union and uh but i have heard that since they have unionized or the work the workers there have unionized which i thought was good because i thought that that was a, a major contradiction of a, of a left alternative uh, workplace that they wouldn't have allowed unions. Um, wait, what happened here? I told you Dr. Ball was triggered and, he had, and, and it had nothing to do with Kim. No, I wasn't mad. I'm, again, I don't have, obviously I don't have a problem with Kim. It was, it was, and I, and I don't have a problem with her praising her, her, her buddy, Lisa, uh, I forgot her full name, the, the journalist sister she was talking about, although, well, you know, I was, it was, it was really just about the real news and, and I, and I'll accept, I'll take that. I'll, I'll deal with, I, I you know, I, I'm, ha I'm, I'm cool with that. I could have handled that better. I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that. Uh, all right. Anyway, good people, man. We are, we approach the three hours here. Let me, let me wrap this up. I, I again, let me. I thank all of you for joining us and helping us hold down the, this time block for the remix morning show. Please come back on Tuesday, our Mondays. I will be here on our actual Monday uh, with Dr. Quasi Carnadu, and we're going to talk more not only about his piece on reparations, but about this journalistic process. He wants to 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 share with us some stuff that he experienced, uh, and who knows who who might else stop by. I do need to. I need to contact him. I think we both forgot. I need to reach out to, I, I mentioned it earlier, the Cornell West theory. I apologize to Tim Hicks. Uh, I think we were supposed to have him back on today and I, I think we both forgot. So my apologies. That's that's my bad. Uh, thanks to Kaba. Thanks to Minister Server. Uh, again, thanks to all of you for real. I really appreciate this. I, I enjoy this stuff thoroughly uh, and uh, I hope we can continue to build uh, this, this platform. Uh, and of course, as always, like my good folks and Pierre over the comedy hype channel, if, if uh, anything I missed or you want to see this later, got something to say, definitely put it in the comments. <laughs> and we'll catch you next time here at I Mix What I Like Live. Don't forget a lot coming up on the channel. Luke, my nation later this evening, last open intellectual with Dr. Layla Brown in the building all throughout like we you, if, if, if if you've been missing like me your good dose of dr brown you need to be there tonight and 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 oh man there's some good stuff in that episode so please check that out and again i haven't seen it yet but i, I can't wait of course for the nine o'clock uh episode uh next episode of renegade culture with minister server ja high the ear doctor and uh 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 l <laughs> Kamal and Kalanji. I working on something for you, Kalanji. The, the, the war has he, you done started it right here, my man. So we'll see you uh, next week. Of course, as Fred Hampton used to say to you, we say peace if you're willing to fight for it. So peace, everybody. Catch you next time here at I Mix What I Like and always here at Black Power Media. Peace, everybody. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What I like, what I like, what I like. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
what I like, what I like, what I 